it's already written off. What's right off? I don't know. But they write it off. It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's superhero slate. It's a modern podcast where we talk about everything that's great. Like movies, TV, superheroes. It's superhero slate. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Superhero Slate, the show where we run down the latest superhero entertainment news. We love TV, movies, and superheroes, so let's talk it all out. My name is Chris Dillard. And my name is Mike Royer. And this week, we're preparing for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Mm, it's coming to theaters this week. one onion ring every day up to the release, which you means gotta, we, need to, we need to double down on a couple days. We have to get a couple <laughs> more of those, yeah. We're going we're gonna to have to... It, it, you ever do that with them where you try to put them on all your hands? Like, you try to put the, the fun hands on all your <laughs> I'm hands? I'm like, I, we've already diverged so far off, but usually, like, I'm so much more precious with onion rings because you get so many fewer compared to, like, a french fry. I feel like I really have to, like, you know, pattern out my, my bites of burger with, like, the bite of onion rings. So uh-huh. it just, it, it increases the anxiety of the meal, uh-huh. but it also increases the flavor of the meal so what are you gonna do well, i'm gonna go with funyuns we'll just we'll just ease ease our way into funyuns yeah there after you go. 10 you're done you're like I, yeah. I can't go 11 uh the midnight sun story returns after 30 years we'll yeah talk and chris about i'm sure will tell us what that is because <laughs> i'm out of the loop here <laughs> yeah exactly and we know why you're all here this week <laughs> we all know why you're all here this week spider-man's no way home trailer breaks the internet i'm putting uh, internet uh, quotes around breaks the internet <laughs> with my internet fingers because yeah, I, I, you hate, I hate that phrase. That, I hate that term, but you know, <laughs> if you're going for SEO and these show notes get uploaded to the website, you know, sometimes we just yeah. gotta put that in there. Exactly. Well, I, I think also uh, it's got some records. It's got a lot. I mean, um, I, again, normally in the forums I, I dive into, uh, there was nothing but Spider Man discussions all week. So um, mm. I, I'm I would, looking. Th- I'm looking forward to talking about the Spider-Man yeah. trailer because, you know, I was going through, I was scrubbing through the trailer today I was as I was making the thumbnail for the podcast this week, and I thought I saw something this time around that I didn't notice the first time, and I, I'll be curious to talk about it, a, a mysterious kind of silhouetted figure that I don't think I've really seen anybody talk about on, like, kind of like the mainstream conversations mm-hmm. of, the, of, the, of the trailer, so I I'm got looking a, forward I, to talking about this. I got ideas for you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I know. So, I mean, this week's been pretty... Um I don't know, pretty quiet for me if I'm going to be completely honest with you. I was in, actually in Chicago for like three days, uh, so I, I didn't really have a whole lot of time to do anything. Um, but it was fun to be in Chicago, Mike. I'll tell you, um, I got to take an architectural boat tour uh, literally oh. when the Spider-Man trailer dropped. So that was uh, my, 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 my the CEO of my company is there with me, right? And he's like, why is your phone blowing up? I'm like... <laughs> There's a Spider Man trailer, you sir. Do not understand how nerdy I am. <laughs> yeah. Whether I'm at sea or land or sky, I will yeah. get the updates for the Spider Man trailer. Exactly. Yeah, I was texting Mike while I was in the air with with their in flight texting. So my the conference I was at that was actually McCormick Place, which is where C two E two is held every year. So my knowledge of that part of Chicago came in really handy a couple of times. Wait, so the conference you were at was literally in the same like floor space as C2E2? It was, yes. So C2E2 is in McCormick Place, which is actually two buildings on each side of an interstate, Mm -hmm. uh, and they're connected by walkway. Um, So this was in in where it usually is once every every other year, and then the other space is the other year. So, yes. Was it kind of eerie walking around the space that's, like, normally for you adorned with, like, the nerdiest nerd stuff, and then you're just kind of seeing these people just, like, handing out, like, free brochures and flash drives and stuff? Yeah, well, yeah, everyone there is a business person. You're going to make business deal so not a single cosplayer inside Mike. it's like uh, business cosplay it's like yeah. cosplay for all of the superhero yeah. movies except before they put the costume on exactly it was very disappointing now. <laughs> but i mean I, I knew the place around and that kind of that kind of paid off and it's weird to see it uh, again like you said so empty compared to you know yeah. convention and uh, i've always it, wondered what it would be like to go into the san diego convention center off season of san diego comic-con because it would just feel so bizarre i think one time i drove in front of the convention center it was like the one time i was ever down in san diego that wasn't associated to the convention it was just like this just feels weird there's supposed to be a mob of people this does not seem right i'm leaving and going back home yeah exactly it it was very i wouldn't say just like concerning i'm like am i in the right place is this the same building (laughs) how can i go up the escalator and not have to you know touch feel, somebody else so it feels like i'm in a dream yeah because when you go up those escalators at comic cons you always have to leave a couple extra steps in between somebody that has like a giant foam sword because you don't mm-hmm. want to get your eye poked out or or the person carrying the suitcase full of comic books like you know across the floor kind of thing yes exactly 
So yes, 100% with that. And then during this event um, also is Games Gamescom, I think was this week. Um, and I, we don't have it in the show notes here, but the Halo uh, Infinite multiplayer trailer came out, Mike, and they released the um, PC specs for it. So if there are any computer gamers, you'd probably be happy to see those uh, those details. Get ready for, for, for Halo this year, even if you don't have an Xbox. Uh, but uh, with that, again, I did fly everywhere and I was traveling, so I didn't get to watch anything or really even relax. Um, I'll, I'll tell you right now, when we talk about What If Later, I caught it on Friday afternoon, finally, like evening. So I'm well behind on, on details here. But you look like, correct me if I'm wrong, is this an Arnold Schwarzenegger film? <laughs> oh, Chris, I'm so glad at least you're <laughs> tangentially familiar with this film that I grew up with. I've been diving back into these movies that I have watched on repeat so many times as a kid, but I was just at that certain age where I just didn't really retain all of the information of the movie and all, especially like the nuance of the story. Cause you know, I was so far from, uh, um, uh, empathizing with any sort of adult problem. So I've been kind of going back and watching these films and the one I watched this week was Arnold Schwarzenegger's 1996 hit eraser. Yeah. And I am surprised I never, ever, ever hear about this movie in pop culture at all. Now, I'm not saying you out there, listener, has never heard of this movie or have seen it, but, like, nobody ever talks about it. And it's really surprising because um, I think it's a, a great movie, and it actually outperformed Batman and Robin and Last Action Hero at the box office. So it's just surprising that... I was expecting to see it lower on the list because no one ever talks about it. It's just this really, really just perfect kind of 90s action movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger plays this witness protection uh, U.S. Marshal that, uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, works alone. And he says that quite a few times in the movie. And along with that, he has some of the best one liners in his entire career, all jammed into this one single movie. At one point in the film, he shoots an alligator that escapes in the face and then says your luggage i mean like that is the type of movie that you're going into here and it's just great it's so much fun the macguffin of the film is is like this futuristic like handheld railgun which back in the day in the 90s was science fiction and like now i think it's kind of like you know passe to like use like electromagnetics to like propulse like projectile stuff so like back then it was just like so much fun and then at one point in the movie he get, he gets to dual wield them and he's like his sleeves have ripped off i don't even remember how his sleeves get ripped off to begin with but it's just like pure arnold and it the screenplay is just really good too it has like this great opening that tells you everything you need to know about his character and you even do like a callback to people that he meets earlier in the movie and it's just great it has um I think it's Vanessa Williams that yes. co-stars in the movie yep. and she like does a song for the movie. So this was back in the day where like you would get an actor in the film that was uh, associated with music so they could make a new track for your song that plays in the credits. It's just great. I love Eraser. It's streaming on HBO Max. You absolutely need to go watch it. It's such a fun time. There's just like I, I think all the gadgets and the little things like that are what I remember as a kid. Like, there's this weird kind of, like, cluster grenade that shoots out drill bits, which I don't understand why it shoots out drill bits, but, and then this rail gun, and then there's these, like, mini discs, right? Like, everybody remembers how the GameCube games were on, like, mini discs. Well, like, before the GameCube, like, made those, like, an actual thing, like, those used to be the futuristic CDs, and, like, those play a part in this. It's just so much fun. I can't talk uh, enough about how just silly and just great eraser is but yeah if you're an arnold fan if you have not seen this one yet you have to it's just great i love it uh I, chris have you ever seen it because oh, you yeah, seem yeah. to be somewhat familiar with oh it. yeah I'm, I'm familiar with the film i remember watching it in, in the 90s it's uh, it kind of gave me what is it um uh double was it double jeopardy kind of vibes like double jeopardy is like a better film of this like kind of thing yeah because like, there's a there yeah there is kind of like a crime legal element yeah to this movie and and like you're trying to hide you know hide yourselves from from i remember he uh, the name comes from he's erasing the identities right like yes because he he's the he's the facilitator that puts these people into witness yeah. protection and it's usually because they're trying to wait until a court date to when they testify. So, you know, it would be within the bad guy's best interest to kill these people. 
I, I um I, again I, not to spoil anything I, and you can just say yes or no. Is, there's a scene with a limousine at some point. Yes, there okay, is. Okay, okay, perfect. That, I, I I remember like I had like they had to catch a train. That's another <laughs> great one liner. <laughs> so oh uh, my god. Yeah. So uh, I, I I do remember this because this and then what was it? Thirteenth day. Was that another uh, or thirteenth hour? Maybe was that another Schwarzenegger film where? He had like it's got the cover with the blue eyes on it, like something. I don't remember. Oh, that's that's that that's not what I'm familiar with. So maybe that's one I need to go back yeah. and watch. Uh, and then I I did I did pull up here just just real quick just to make sure. Um, uh, Alan Silvestri did do the music for this. He's known for creating the Avengers theme song. Oh, um, perfect. We found a way to hook it back into the show. And also, this isn't necessarily related, but the the director of Eraser was the same guy who directed uh, Jim Carrey's The Mask. Too. So, I mean, it's just like you got your full on 90s with this film eraser. I think anybody can watch this movie. I don't think this is just for like action fans or anything like that. It's just it's just a good movie perfectly encapsulating the time that it was made. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, eraser, go check it out on HBO Max. But if you wanted to go watch something a little bit newer, we saw this pop up on our uh, Hulu page this weekend. A brand new movie. I, I believe it's a Hulu original. I don't know if it's one of those scenarios where it was originally going to hit theaters, but Hulu bought it, or if it was Hulu from start to finish, but it's a film called Vacation it, Friends, is, and we went in basically knowing nothing with very low this, expectations. Is this your second John Cena film of the month? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know what? John Cena has not been in the Hollywood game for very long, and I haven't gone and looked it up, but I may be a John Cena completionist he, by now with he, his Hollywood <laughs> career. He, uh, I saw this as in this, but uh, what was it? Uh, Fast Nine is like the highest grossing movie of the pandemic, which isn't saying much, but like uh, also a movie starring John Cena this year. Yes, uh, exactly. And that's one that I, I've caught. So I may be a John Cena completionist. I, I'll, I maybe need to go back and look at his, uh, his uh, moviography. What do they call it? I don't even know. I, I want to say discography. Filmography. <laughs> the filmography, that's right. Yeah. So uh, John Cena's in it along with uh, Lil Rel, and I can't remember the actress's name, but she's like the best friend it, of Issa Rae in Insecure. It, it, yeah, correct me, Lil Rey, he was also in uh, Space Jam, I believe, was one of the... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. So both of these guys <laughs> have made kind of uh, quote-unquote tentpole H- movies. Uh, this HBO year. Max staples for the month of <laughs> July, that's for yeah. sure. Uh, but Vacation Friends is just this kind of, uh, I don't want to say romantic comedy, but it's kind of more leaning comedy with these, uh, these two couples that... Uh, kind of begrudgingly become friends during their uh, kind of Caribbean vacation and then how things transpire after they go back home to get married. Uh, we went in with very low expectations and had a pretty good time. It's definitely not a perfect movie. I think the the reviews are kind of sitting around kind of like a, a 6 out of 10 or, you know, something like yeah. that. And, you know, that, that feels feels about right. But John Cena has a pretty good performance in this film where he's kind of playing this uh, kind of a pl- uh, oblivious kind of like uh, strong, like buff jock, which really fits his uh, type of persona. But John Cena is such a funny actor. Like, I, I, I can't tell if this is just big big giant muscle man reading lines is funny or if he's adding something to it and after seeing a couple of his films now so and a lot of them being comedies because he was in uh blockers he was in uh train wreck and now he's been in this so he's been in like pretty solid comedy movies so far so he's got the comedy chops and i have to say like i've, I've really uh, enjoyed john cena and i guess you could probably call the suicide squad like a comedy especially mm-hmm. uh yeah. the performance it's a dark that he comedy. Gives. yeah so i am down for basically any movie that he's going to be in that's uh that's got the word comedy in the description so uh, it, it, go in with low expectations or no expectations. You know, you could definitely kind of be on your but phone while you're watching this movie, and you'll be fine. It, again, it's a like you said, Hulu uh, original, probably. Uh, in, in if it's on there, it's probably. I'm not saying it's gonna. Uh, Hulu puts out low qual or low quality stuff, but I mean that kind of gives me an indication of like, uh, this didn't go to like a big a big studio didn't buy this one. Yeah, you know, out the gate, it probably yeah went down but, the, d- down the line to Hulu. Yeah, but there are some solid laughs in here, and also you should have Hulu anyway because I know you're watching Reservation Dogs every every Sunday, which is uh, Taika Waititi's uh, kind of executive produced uh, TV show right now. Every week's been hilarious, so if you're paying to watch Reservation Dogs, you might as well uh, mm-hmm. go check out Vacation Friends if you got a little bit of time. But that's I, what I would, that's what I've been watching this week, Chris. Uh, I'm gonna be continue diving down the Arnold switch Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
uh, rabbit hole, um, I'm going to get my wife to watch uh, T1 and T2 because okay. she has seen them, but it's been a very, very long time. So it's going to be kind of like a fresh watch for her. And I, I made the realization today when I was thinking of all these Arnold Arnold movies, I was like, he has just been a staple of my childhood. <laughs> like oh, yeah. every movie he made, like Batman and Robin, True Lies, uh, Twins. Actually, it's been forever since I've seen Twins. I could probably watch they, that movie again, too. They said they were making like a sequel to that, I thought. Uh, oh, I thought I heard something about that, too. Huh. Are they involved with it? I don't even know. I could not, I could not tell you. But, I mean, I, I agree. Like, I think we're of that age where 80s – action stars were like everything we could get our vhs hands on in the 90s was an 80s mm-hmm. action movie right because um total recall is one of my favorite movies uh of his and then also oh, yeah. the running man um which you know is where he's on that game show essentially uh mm-hmm. those are like the two when i think of arnold Schwarzenegger, those are the two movies i think of uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it's nothing that you know there's nothing wrong with predator or any of those but like those are the two i just Im- immediately go to when i think mm-hmm. of him uh, and then um, the other movie I have, which I always forget he's in, is Red Sonja. Uh, are you familiar with Red Sonja? Oh, I've, I've actually never seen that, but I, I suppose, especially since we have a comic book kind of podcast, I probably should go back and watch that. She, she, yeah, Red Sonja is a comic book character that I believe was somebody else and then it was bought by Marvel recently. Uh, but essentially, he he doesn't play Hercules or Conan, but he plays... Hercules and Conan in a different name in that in that so um, yeah I, I I agree with you like there's just a lot of those like um, 80s action movies name me late 90s early 90s action movies that just scream uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and what what oh. was it uh, was it Kindergarten Cop it's not mm-hmm. a Tuma <laughs> I always think of that classic. So. Uh, we're just going to change this to the superhero slate uh, podcast featuring Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. movies uh, moving yeah, forward exactly we'll, we'll come up with a, a good a good name for this list of, of movies mike your, your, your <laughs> checklist uh but if that's it let's jump into this week this week we get finally another marvel movie in theaters only this is the first one since spider-man mm-hmm. far from home that's been theaters only and it's shang chi and the legend of the ten rings and let me tell you i realized this week seeing this movie two weeks early has really hampered my ability to talk about this movie <laughs> everybody else. like i really want to talk about it and i'm like ah, oh, there's a small group of people here yeah, uh, I mean, this 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 is really telling to me because uh, Chris knows that I do not want to know anything about this movie. He's he's not giving me any initial impressions. He's just kind of giving me, like, vague vibes, if you will. And I would say the vibes are trending positive in my end. Or he's going the totally different direction, and this is the worst movie he's ever seen, and he's just so excited to talk about how bad it is. But yeah. I don't think it's going that direction. So I have to say I'm starting to get on the hype train more and more like i'm moving up carts i was like in the back eating cockroaches yeah. and now like i'm moving to the fancier carts in the hype train so i'm excited we got buffer seats because you know this is our first time going back to the theater and we're going like in like the first showing on a saturday morning so the buffer seats are like extra cheap too so oh, yeah. there's just going to be empty seats next to us it's going to be great so uh we're not going to have any snacks we're not going to eat anything even though we're vaccinated you know scientifically we're probably okay but you know it's the first time back we just want to ease into it Safe, so maybe by the sorry. time we see maybe by the time we see spider-man in december things will be a little bit uh yeah. easier but excited for shang chi I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I think we may we might be doing our spoiler cast recording on Saturday. So if you really want to know know what we think, you might be able to listen a day early for that one. Yeah. But we'll keep you posted. Check, yes. make sure you're subscribed, and check those feeds. It, it is a holiday weekend, uh, so you know we're trying to maneuver not just doing podcasts all the time, but you know that's how that's how this goes. Anytime we have a long weekend, a movie drops the Friday before. <laughs> uh, it's like the, the theaters playing this out or something. Yeah, uh, or trailers drop on a Monday. You know, oh, the day after we record the podcast, which is always a bummer. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's how that's how it goes. Uh, but, um, yes, yeah, Shang-Chi and Ten Rings opening this week. I will confirm myself there's a mid-credits and a post-credits scene. Um, and and so do not get up. Do not leave. You want to watch these. Uh, so that's that's my that's my takeaway here. There are long credits. So if you have to go to the bathroom between the mid and the end, you're, you're more than one. You'll have more than enough. Yeah, the, v- the VFX teams are only getting larger and larger, so it takes longer and longer for these credits to roll. 
Yeah, I've also not seen any more previews for this since I've been to the theater, so it's very interesting for me. Like, I don't know what they're putting out there, uh, what, mm-hmm. what else. But, like, again, the trailers have been very um, uh, conservative in this film, which is which is my maybe the, the, the opposite of another movie trailer we're talking about at the <laughs> end of this. So I'm very excited to get, hear what everyone thinks of this movie. I want to I wanna know uh, when people people think when when they get there so do write us if you see it this week let us know i'm going thursday at six uh again here in in my local theater so um very very excited to to get out and 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 see this this movie mike uh anything else questions or concerns for shang chi before we move on to the next item that you want to ask here i'm ready i'm ready to go man i'm ready to go lock and load well speaking of things and i have no transition there you're gonna have to yeah. forgive me on that. cowboy bebop uh they we actually have a november release date for this mike uh, i saw netflix mm-hmm. dropped it this week they didn't give us a trailer though uh or they just gave us like two or three screenshots so i'm kind of a little i'm a little disappointed if you will however i know netflix really hypes up their marketing the month beforehand uh, yeah i feel like normally we don't see a netflix trailer until we're almost ready to stream it and i don't know if that's strategy on their end or what exactly is going on but we have some like kind of official shots from it and uh, everything looks great uh we finally get to see uh john is it john cho right? john cho yep. um we finally get to see him in the spike spiegel kind of classic uh large kind of I, I large i guess large collar but what's it called on a suit when the collar comes down on the front of the chest like it's kind of like those those wing lapel? flap folds or is that yeah the large lapel suit which is something that you only got a chance to see if people were photoshopping his head onto yeah. uh, onto uh, Spike Spiegel's uh, body from the anime. So he looks great. Um, all the other characters are looking good. Uh, we're missing Ed, which is a classic character from the anime, but I wouldn't be surprised if maybe we meet Ed somewhere along the lines of the series, so it'll be kind of like a fun reveal when we get to see Ed. We do get to see Ayn, which is the corgi, yeah. the little doggy everybody loves, and surprise, surprise, it just looks like every other corgi out there, so I guess they saved themselves a little bit of work that when they made the anime, they never made Ed special in any way. I think Ed, if I remember right, was genetically engineered or something. There's some sort of, like computer code or something associated with the dog or maybe it ate or maybe the dog ate like a microchip or something in the episode i don't remember but yeah. visually nothing is special about ed it's just a cute little corgi but the internet as misogynistic and dumb as it is uh obviously went uh, full tilt on faye valentine which is the female of the group of course and there is i'm sure a very small vocal minority of people that were upset that she was not scantily clad like she is in the anime. And uh, their reasoning for uh, being upset is, well, some people have successfully cosplayed as the character from the anime, so I don't understand why uh, TV budget couldn't uh, put her in this costume. And it's if you're not familiar with the anime, it's basically like no clothes at all. It's just like these tiny little shorts and there's something that kind of like vaguely looks like a bra and like that's it. And it's just like... Did, did you really think in the year of 2021 that they were going to put, like, a lead female actress in that costume? Yeah. And, like, excuse me for being brash here, but all I want to do is tell these people is just go jerk off and then you'll be over it, right? It's just, like, like it's just these, like, teenage boys are just, like, they're too much in their own hormones. And it's just, like, it's super frustrating. I think sometimes people forget that you're here to serve a narrative and not to serve the costume that some people drew like a couple decades ago, right? (laughs) So uh, that's my little bit of rant here of like, if you're so obsessed with her not looking like that, just go, I don't know, go look at her like in her cartoon yeah. form and well, get your jollies you know it's yeah. just it's just super dumb <laughs> well it's it's one of those things so netflix uh, again uh we don't have it in our notes here but you did confirm umbrella academy season three is wrapped mm-hmm. um you know they took uh, a comic book and adapted it and they will make some changes right like the the tv show cowboy bebop which uh aired what was it 80s or 90s uh i want to say it was the Early 90s. to mid nineties, I want to say ninety seven to ninety eight. Uh, just oh, okay. I had to pull it up here. Um, yeah, they they're not going to do a one for one translation. Like if they did a one for one translation over, that would be no good, right? Like just watch the original at that point. So I think they'll make some some stuff here. I did pull it up here. Uh, Ed, the character Ed, has not been cast yet. Mm-hmm. So um, so they, they're probably leaving that for like some sort of surprise uh, along the way. Yeah, who knows? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's like a, a, a stinger at the end of the yeah. season or something like that. But a very popular hacker character. Yeah. People like Ed. 
And then also the uh, this series uh, last time we the announcement uh, they don't have it on, on any there is uh, Chris Yost was writing the series who uh, created the character X twenty three for Marvel and wrote most of Earth's Mightiest Heroes mm-hmm. uh, the the show so to bring it back to us you know I, I you know that's that's pretty good so v- I don't very know. much I'm very much looking forward to this Th- this could be like the first time. Uh, possibly that uh, a live action adaptation of an anime goes over well, right? So I'm waiting to see how that goes. Uh, I think everybody (laughs) needs to be cautiously cautiously optimistic, though, because uh, it's yet to be pulled off, right? Unless there's, like, an obvious example that I'm just I can't recall off the top of my head. Cowboy Bebop has always given me Firefly vibes, if I was going to be completely honest. Like, it's not like it's not My Hero Academia. It's not Dragon Ball or Gundam, right? Like, it's fairly easy to translate this. Like, it's not like yeah. you're going wild and mad and like, oh my gosh, you got big robots or superpowers. It seems fairly tame. Yeah, that's the that's the thing is there's no big narrative that you have to fight when it comes to uh, Cowboy Bebop. It, it's just it's 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 relatively vanilla, right? This is almost kind of they have they could run the possibility of what happened with Ghost in the Shell, which is all of the kind of the groundbreaking kind of stories that Ghost in the Shell broke. By the time that they remade it, you know, just a couple of years ago, all of that stuff is just kind of rote. You know, we had done that stuff in pop culture like a thousand times over already. So yeah. Cowboy Bebop is pretty straightforward. It's just kind of space bounty hunters, which we have seen in so many different iterations. Just like you said, like Firefly. You know, I'm yeah. sure Firefly, you know, was riffing off of other animes and Cowboy Bebop. I wouldn't be surprised if Joss Whedon has been quoted somewhere saying that Cowboy Bebop was an inspiration for fly, for, for Firefly. So, yeah, yeah they, there's not a story that they have to fight or grind up against. I would say more it's just making sure that you hit the cool vibes. Like, when you watch Cowboy Bebop, you're just like, this is just oozing cool. And they're bringing back the original... Um, the original uh, composer? The, uh, mu- the composer for it. So you're going to have that vibe is going to hit there. So, so the, things are looking good. They're trending up. So we're just going to hope that it for, keeps going up. <laughs> for those uh, not in the know, such as myself and any other listener, uh, Cowboy Bebop was the first anime to be broadcast on Adult Swim in the United States. Um, and people uh, are labeled as a gateway series to anime as a whole because of... Uh, you know how the, not vanilla it is, but like you know how I would it can say, introduce stuff to that. I would say the relatable Western themes from b- both definitions of the of the word Western, American Western, and then also just like Western kind of cowboy. So it's just it's easy for an American audience to just kind of understand right away, you know, what's West, going on. Yeah, Western and noir theme. So yeah, yeah. I, I feel like you know this is something I I feel I could jump on pretty easily when it comes out, and not have to not have to go watch the original. But if I had to, I wouldn't feel like you know. Um, like reading stuff like that. Like when I tried to watch Ta- Attack on Titan, I did not. Oh, uh, yeah, it, I don't know how the hell you adapt. I knew, I know, I know they've kind of already tried, but yeah, that's, they, it's too, it's a little too wild. I think it's a, it's a little wild. So yeah, so um, yeah, so November nineteenth, twenty one, twenty one on Netflix. So if you already got it, you're gonna get it for free. And uh, as soon as the trailer drops, we'll be able to share that with you. We're gonna jump in the trailers. Mike was talking about jerking it for some reason last <laughs> thing, so we're gonna talk about the Kingsman, which actually mentions it straight off the bat in this uh, in this red band trailer for the upcoming prequel film. Uh, I we, we've not heard about Kingsman's franchise in a while. Uh, just just to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> it's because the character at the beginning of the trailer talks yeah. about stomach being full and his balls being empty. So. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, we're no, not just randomly talking about you know. Watch the trailer, you guys will understand. That's what I'm trying to say. Here. <laughs> anyway, yes, new but, Kingsman trailer, something but, that we haven't seen in a bit. But it is red band, and they. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's gory, but like the language is there, and I guess some of the yeah. scenes. Um, you know, we've not heard about Kingsman at all. This is a prequel. This is like what World War One, I, I think, maybe uh, era. Uh, maybe because there are cars in this, yes. Yeah. So World War One era. Uh, Ray Fiennes is in this. Uh, Jim Arterton, uh, Jimon Honshu, uh, you know, and um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name who was who's uh, Rasputin in there. Uh, he played the Lizard in the Amazing Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, so that's how we bring this back. But anyway, uh, this looks it looks looks interesting. I, I again, I don't know much about the the story yet. Right, it still feels like a teaser trailer. Uh, but it, I, it honestly feels like we've been getting the same trailer every yeah. time this comes out. But for some reason, this one just seems to be a little bit more refined. I feel like we get uh, slightly more Kingsman gags, if you will, yeah. like a little bit, um, a little bit of action humor, scenes. Which, yeah, uh, it seems and to be like this, the long the one shot stuff is in there. 
Yeah, and I, I was ac- I was ac- a- uh, asking you after we uh, watched this trailer before we started recording if this was still directed by Matt Matthew Vaughn. Vaughn, right? that's correct. Yeah, yeah it's not Matt Reeves. I, but... <laughs> yeah, I keep getting getting them confused, but yeah, we got a lot of uh, similar action staples, like this kind of like the speed ramping, quick moving. Yeah camera we see a little bit of that it pushes the in the trailer it pushes in on some of those shots too kind of thing yeah i, I don't think that they're gonna have a version of Freebird in this movie because they'll probably try to keep it air accurate with music well or who knows maybe not i i i think that them just adjusting the period of time will fix an issue that i had with the second kingsman where they just went way too off the rails with the technology yeah. and they just kind of broke the own the rules of their own universe so going back to world war one uh the only kind of really fancy thing i saw was a gun sword which i don't know if we had seen in previous trailers but it looked pretty cool and we all know chris loves final fantasy 8 and his gun sword gun blades so so we're off to a good start here yeah this just looks fun i feel like my opinion of this has changed over time in a positive way it's almost kind of like the opposite of um some other movies that we had long been waiting for it's just like oh we just keep getting trailer after trailer and it's just like this movie should have came out a while ago because of the pandemic and now i'm just like tired of seeing it uh but now with kingsman i feel like i've come back around i've come full circle because it's just like oh you know uh kingsman 2 left a bad taste in my mouth i'm you know i'm not super excited to go back into the kingsman universe right now but uh, now we've had like an extra year so now i'm like okay yeah i think i could jump back in and see what's going on well, I, I would even say it's been even longer. I think it was pushed back when for, for the the Fox merger with Disney, right? Went back uh-huh. um, the release, so it was pushed back a little bit lower. But like you said, this looks to be like you know, there's a flintlock rifle. Um, Jim uh, Arterton is shooting at some point. There's sword fights. Uh, someone gets decapitated uh, in, in like uh, some sort of like one big shot move there. Uh, I, I yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how the Kingsman kind of started. This feels more in line with the original story the first one story i i, I think there'll be a lot of parallels between kingsman and kingsman um mm-hmm. in terms of parallels because it looks like some young man is being you know introduced to the kingsman for the first time and like being recruited mm-hmm. kind of thing so um yeah i'm i'm on the, i'm on board this is december 22nd 2021 if it still comes out this is also something i would love to see on streaming if they did it so yeah um, i mean it'll be competing at the box office with spider-man i yeah. mean one of the uh, biggest uh trailer watches of all time will be competing uh, yeah. uh, head to head with this film so uh, good luck <laughs> yeah and, and it's R rated so knowing that is like your audience is already small right so mm-hmm. like um, we'll, we'll see how this goes you know I think the Kingsman brand is, is still you know um, uh, for, for Mike you put it above Venom brand so uh, I think I think there's uh, some some weight there so we'll uh, see I, as we can I just closer. saw this Chris you devilish man who organizes our show notes he's making you wait until almost the end of the podcast till we talk about Spider-Man uh, No Way Home I, I like am. the strategy though that's how you get people to listen to the yeah, whole show yeah you, you suckers are listening to this and if you want to hear <laughs> that you gotta go to the end however we do put time codes in, so if you don't want to listen to us blather on you can just go to the end we, doesn't, we that's don't the, care that's, that's the cheat code we offer you yeah that's right uh, Matrix Resurrection CinemaCon was this week, Mike, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, I think Gamescom as well. It was really interesting. All these things are not at once, but the next Matrix movie is called Matrix Resurrections, um, which kind of goes in with Revelations and Reloaded, right? Uh, the other yeah. two titles. I-, I saw some people uh, bragging on the internet this week of like, "Oh, I guessed the title, you know, six years ago of what the next Matrix movie would be called." And I was just like, "This is not a far stretch. This isn't yeah. kind of like guessing the next Spider-Man." Uh, title that just somehow you have to incorporate the word home in some clever way. Uh, This is just pick an R word that kind of fits the vibe of the the series so far. Yeah, so if if you guess the title of this one, uh, I I don't want to say you don't deserve a pat on the back, but maybe just kind of like a like a, a quick thumbs up, like, oh, okay, good job, yeah. and then, you know, never talk yeah. about it again yeah. because it's not that impressive. <laughs> you, you, you've, it's, like, it's like picking, the, like, what day do you think the Spider-Man trailer is going to drop? It'll be a Monday. Uh, yeah. We recorded <laughs> on Sunday kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so at a CinemaCon, a, a trailer um, debuted, and it kind of showed a long-haired, bearded Keanu Reeves is what, is what I'm, I'm hearing about this. Mm-hmm. And then also, like, he talks to Carrie Ann Moss, who doesn't know who he is, and apparently, like, there's no memory of the previous series, but chronologically, this is after them. So, um, like, uh, the, all the characters have collective amnesia, or, like, their memories have been wiped? Yeah, or? I think at the end of 3, didn't they say, like, you know, apparently, you know, uh, Neo, the one merged with the Matrix, and 
they restarted everything in this peaceful time. But that, that's well, really yeah, I guess if are. you had to use like computer terminology, like the world has been like restarted. Yeah, <laughs> a factory re- reset, uh, yeah. a clean a clean OS install. Some some human got out and had a paperclip and was pushing it in the back of the mainframe and was holding that red button until oh, it my. reset. That actually is that actually does not seem too far fetched because they <laughs> always kind of showed these like big broad ideas and just kind of distilled them to what it would look like in the human world like you yeah. know you grab like a phone to like to leave the matrix and I, yeah i wouldn't be surprised if it was just like a little like paperclip that'd be really funny and, and well it's interesting here because, again I, was, I talked about this last time the matrix first came out in early 2000s right like mm-hmm. very early 2000s um you know corded telephones and the internet were still brand new things uh mm-hmm. if you had a cell phone you were rich so now we're in an interesting world where all this stuff technology is jump forward decades all right at least two decades probably a lot more in terms of technology jumps but like you know I, i'm excited to kind of see how they, they take this matrix world to a new level um, yeah so this so this is something that i've i've never really quite realized before uh so the matrix trilogy is kind of has a lot of parallels in my personal life to the Star Wars prequels. Like the first Matrix movie came out the yeah. exact same years as, as the Phantom Menace. I don't know exactly how they lined up after that. Oh, because it was ninety nine. Oh lord. Yeah. So uh, I have a very similar feeling because I was at that age where, like, I did not understand all of the crazy, confusing stuff that was happening in both franchises. So I just, you know, I was a child, so I just paid attention to, like, oh, the big mechs in in the second and third uh, Matrix movies. Or I'm just looking at, like, the new colored lightsabers in in the Star Wars prequels. It wasn't until years later that I realized that these movies, like, people did not like them. And then as as I started to kind of, like, understand and just like films more in general. It's just like, oh yeah, these these prequel movies aren't really working out. But I have never gone back to the Matrix franchise mm-hmm. and really looked at it in any sort of like editorial way, right? So I don't really have a connection to the Matrix movies. I just know people didn't really didn't like the second one and the third one, and I don't really know what the cultural consensus was on the whole finale of the whole trilogy. Oh, they, did, they re- people did not like it. Yeah, uh, I, I but think- I know. The, uh, I, yeah, but like ahead. the, I just never really went back in and explored it, and I never really followed the Wachowskis kind of after the Matrix in general. Like I, I didn't really watch their Netflix series. I never got around the Cloud Atlas. Yeah. Uh, I definitely did not watch the Jupiter Ascending. Ascending. No, no yeah, Speed so, Racer. Uh, no, I haven't even seen Speed Racer, but oh, I have Speed actually Racer's heard good, good things about Speed yeah. Racer, how that's actually good. So, like, I, I know of the Wachowskis, but I just do not know. I, I'm not educated on their uh, film work. So uh, the long and the short of it is when I go back to watch The Matrix 4, I have no idea what to expect. I don't yeah. know how the Wachowskis have evolved as filmmakers well, over the years. I don't just, know if they feel like they need to redeem their trilogy in some way. So, it's just it's just it's all around strange and uh, uh, weird to me. I don't know what to expect, Chris. So. First of all, it's only one of the Wachowskis returned for this movie. Um, okay, so that was that was a big deal. Like there were some interviews this week. Um, they have both um, transitioned. They're both uh, transgender. Um, so they uh, were men when they made the first ones, women when they made the second. So they feel like there's like a lot of like we were different people when we made those movies. It was like some of the interview stuff kind of going on. So I'm interested uh-huh. to see not necessarily how that affects it, but like how essentially have they as filmmakers changed as well right like mm-hmm. you know their their uh, experiences in life uh, all the matrix movies i did double check this are on hbo max for you to stream at mm-hmm. your heart's content mike uh but i remember watching them um and, and kind of like you know that was like my early uh days in the film critiquing a little bit and you know the internet but like they're full of action and stuff but like i will tell you what i hate the most about the matrix two and three is like the parallels to uh like Jesus and like the Bible journey, like it is uh, they, like Snyder, one for they one. Snydered it before Snyder yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you kind of get your vibe of that at the first, first, right. He, he dies and comes back. Uh, cause he's, he's one with it. But like, I, I'm not saying that, you know, those things are bad, but like, it's very like heavy handed and like how close and similar it is in mm-hmm. that. So, um, I'm excited for the resurrections. Neil Patrick Harris is in this again. Uh, kind of Reeves, Carrie and Moss, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith is returning. I'm excited to kind of see this and how things have evolved since, yeah. you know, almost I mean, 20 years later. Yeah, I guess we sh- we shouldn't make promises, but, you know, we have told the audience that we are going to go back and watch uh, James Cameron's Avatar and then do a spoiler mm. cast before the next one comes out. But it might be fun to kind of watch all three Matrix movies and kind of just sit down and yeah. chat about them for a little bit before the next one comes out. It's just I, I need to go back and I need to experience the, them again. The first Matrix was actually one of the, was the first movie I ever owned on DVD as well. 
Um, so to me, it holds like a special place, right? Because like that's mm-hmm. that's a huge technology turning point was DVDs. So we had a DVD player, and I was like, I got the Matrix. And I was like, this is fantastic. Like this is the perfect movie to watch on a disc. Uh, so um, kind of very very excited. For that um, and, and Resurrections, I believe, is there a release date for this? Um, December 22nd as well, Mike. That's why I had it right here. So December This year? Is, yeah. Wow. I was I was honestly expecting 2022. No, they have uh, – this is also one of the day and dates with HBO Max um, just before oh, we – Oh, okay. This is like the last one of, of the whole deal is uh, The Matrix Resurrection. So we will get to watch it in theaters and HBO Max day and date. I do want to take a sidebar here, Mike. I did okay. see an interview with um, what's her name, the lady who made Wonder Woman eighty four, the director Patty Jenkins, mm-hmm. and she said she was very disappointed in how HBO Max uh, day and date release, and she'll never do it again. And I said, "You made a shitty goddamn movie. <laughs> you should feel bad for that, not where it streamed, because if it was popular enough, people would have watched it somewhere. But like that was a really bad movie, and you should feel bad for that instead." So. Uh, <laughs> That's my soapbox for that because I'm like this this article saying like she'll oh, she'll never do day and day again. I'm like if you made a good movie, you probably would have seen results on both ends. But like you made a bad movie and it would never have done well in theaters as a, you know other than that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, the, yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, the big screen is not going to change the quality of your yeah. movie overall unless it's a big dumb action movie. Which right. honestly, you could you could argue that the small screen did her favors because of that crazy action set piece where Wonder Woman swings in the middle of the desert and saves that mannequin in the middle of the road because yeah. it's a mannequin. They did not bother to, to swap it out with a CG yeah. child. So, right. yeah, the, uh, the small screen did you some favors. Exactly. Uh, it, it got more coverage than I think it would have uh, other than that. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> the book of Boba Fett, the upcoming uh, uh, sequel uh, to the Mandalorian TV show, spinoff, is rumored to feature the live action debut of bounty hunter Cad Bane. Are you familiar with Cad Bane, Mike? From Blue the... Guy Cowboy Hat. Yes. That has <laughs> that's, a very... how I, that's how I remember him. <laughs> He's got a very menacing voice. Uh, Willem Dafoe has been rumored to possibly portray him or do his voice oh, in the live action cool. series. Uh, but he had really big roles in the Clone Wars. He actually like kidnapped, um, uh, well, not Emperor, but like Senator Palpatine or whatever he was at the time before he was Emperor. Uh, and like caused a lot of problems for people, but like he has been in the Clone Wars and the Bad Batch. He is probably one of my favorite additions to the the universe. Has not been brought over to live action yet. Um, you know the if they do this, it was, would be like the second show with the big bad blue guy uh, because the other one's Thrawn, right? For the other show, so mm-hmm. um, yeah, I could totally see them. You know, wanting to do this because he's just he's. We talked about Western stuff, right? Cow in cowboy, view. like he's a Western bad guy. He's got the spurs on his boots. He's got the big cowboy hat. He's got a straw, a, a, a piece of straw sticking out of his mouth at any time. He's just smooth and suave for a bounty yeah, hunter. He, he's a he's a character that I would. I'm curious how they would end up executing them. Right? This is. I feel I hope like they don't it, kill him, but yes. <laughs> well, if okay. it was, I'm, I'm kidding. kidding. But if it was classic Star Wars, I think you could do like a, a, a prosthetic face, you know, pretty easily because he's a humanoid uh, looking character. Um, and then, you know, minimal mouth flaps for the mouth moving because the mouth is detached further down from the eyes. Um, but, you know, the the, Mand- uh, the Mandalorian crew, the Boba Fett crew, they got the money to do a CG face. Yeah. So maybe it'll be a hybrid of both. Yeah. And what is uh, he reminds me visually, if, if, if no one's looked up yet. He the Ebony Maw from the Avengers movies, right? He looks oh, like him yeah. but blue. Kind of Yeah, the, the the kind of the Squidward uh snout. <laughs> yeah, like 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 no real like nose, but like he's still got a face yeah. in it. They're and just stuff. gonna take that three D model and put a blue shader over it and yeah. slap on a hat and call it a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I, I'm excited to see that. Um Mike, you got a chance to watch the, the behind the scenes thing for the Mandalorian. <gasps> I did. Can did, I talk about it? Well, so we're gonna jump into the Mandalorian. I'll put I'll put the time <laughs> notes here. But I know they, my my favorite thing is they faked everyone out and said it's Plo Koon instead of Luke Skywalker uh, at the end. So like, did they Dave, show any Dave, concept art to make that look like a person kind of thing? <laughs> they uh, basically what they did is they had some uh, normal kind of two co- D concept art of an artist who did a, a physical rent a uh, physical art artistic rendering of it, and then they just had this funny scene where they just three D tracked a three D model of Plo Koon's head onto. Um, onto uh the the luke body uh at at the end of that final episode and it's just it's just roughly tracked it's really really funny uh but uh yeah that uh that behind the scenes was really really crazy 
uh, because Dave Filoni was like playing 3D chess because he was just like, I know my fans, the deep cut fans know I love Plo Koon. So if we really want to throw them off, we're going to do the Plo Koon double fake because they'll believe it because they know I love Plo Koon and I know that they know that I love Plo Koon. (laughs) So I love that he was doing that uh, that extra that extra level like, of secrecy, the like Princess and, Bride kind of mentality. Yeah, I, you haven't had a chance to watch it. Yet, I, I have right? not yet, but I've seen a lot of uh, articles and stuff kind of spin out of it. Yeah, well, the thing is, I, I'm not too worried about spoiling it because I think a lot of the really fun stuff in it is the visuals that you get to see along the way. Uh, so a, a lot of the information has kind of been disseminated, disseminated, like you said, we, through articles. But the the uh, the behind the scenes does two different things for me. Right, first, it gives me a lot of respect for the production of this last episode. And I think you talked about this a lot, Chris, when we first reacted to the end of, you were like, oh, I bet they didn't have a lot of time. I bet it was a really small crew, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to keep it secret because they never are able to keep anything secret in Hollywood anymore. And you were were basically correct in that sense of they had the smallest crew possible. The rest of the team was filming the Robert Rodriguez episode um, at the time. And they just kept the staff as small as possible. Even the um, even the editors that were working on some of the, the facial stuff was literally locked in a room. They locked him in there so nobody else could go in and see what he was working on because he's sitting in front of like these wall of monitors and everything. So I do get a lot of respect for kind of the decisions that they had to make, right? Because uh, John Favreau in the documentary does this really good job of laying down the paths that they could have gone down. And I was very happy that they did not divert from talking about deep fakes, right? Because now it's all out there in the zeitgeist. Yeah. They even hired somebody that did a really, really popular deep fake over what they produced. And they even showed, amazingly, their deep fake process. And they're like, this is what we almost did. And this is what it looks like. And it looks close, right? But they just had to make the kind of the final artistic call of like, our deep fake process is not quite there just yet. Let's kind of go back to the more of the traditional methods of kind of like what Peyton Reed was familiar with with uh, de-aging um, in the Ant-Man movies. And, you know, they did a little bit of what they uh, de-aged with uh, Tarkin, which I guess wasn't de-aging. It was just a full 3D uh, replication. Yeah. But they kind of just meshed those two together. Now, when we talked about it in React of the Luke Skywalker return, my big problem with it was the voice. To me, the right. voice yeah. totally ruined the immersion. And I could kind of get over the visual factor of it. Like, I get it. He's not that young anymore. So they kind of have to do something. I can deal with that disconnect. But the voice drives me crazy. And nobody was talking about the voice when this episode came out. I didn't see any hot takes. I didn't see any articles, anybody talking about the voice. People just ran with the fact that... um that Mark Hamill was on set and that he must have done the voice or I think I even saw some people reporting he did the voice and so we just need to we just need to call it what it is he is the same actor he's a little bit older but you know he could maybe sound younger because he's a professional voice actor who knows but I was like something is not right here this does not sound like him this does not even sound like a human and I was vindicated because it is not as a totally synthesized voice from an artificial intelligence program they took all of this um, recorded data of Mark Hamill during that era and then they fed it into a computer and then they had it spit out lines and this thing was the furthest from ready I went back and I rewatched the scene even my wife was in the room with me and it's just like I don't know how anybody thinks this sounds like Mark Hamill, uh, old Mark Hamill or even a young Mark Hamill. This sounds like a robot. Like there's even parts of the inflection where I feel I feel like I'm hearing digital noise and I'm sure I'm not. It's probably just my psycho, the psychological part of my brain going a computer made this. So that's the thing that breaks the total immersion from me. I don't know if there was I don't know if there would have been a better way to do it or if they were just so concentrated on getting the visuals right that once they got something that was just kind of close enough they decided to run with it but I was I felt very vindicated when I learned I wasn't going crazy like it is not a human like they they didn't even bring in older Mark Hamill to record lines and they like de-aged his voice it was just purely synthesized and they seem very proud of it and I don't know why because it sounds like garbage to me so I guess that's the biggest takeaway that I took from it as a little vindication for the voice but of course, I have to say there's still it, it's still a fascinating watch. You got to watch this behind the scenes to, just to see visually everything that they did, and so much thought went into it. Like they they even thought about like how would Luke Skywalker after Jedi fight, right? Because they even mentioned that like 
you know, we've seen Ahsoka fight, and Ahsoka is technically Luke Sr. She's actually been trained by, like, real Jedi Knights in their prime. Like, Luke would just kind of be adapting to his own fighting style, and I was really impressed that they were thinking about things at that granular level. So you could, there's a lot of appreciation that goes into this, but, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, we have what that was executed. So, you know, mm. it was... It was cool, but I did see some people online that was just like, I just wish it was, was Plo Koon. I think yeah, you yeah, could have just yeah. swapped Plo Koon in there. That you would have hit pretty much the same story beats. But when I went back, so I watched the documentary and everything, and I went back and I watched the scene again. And surprisingly, the biggest takeaway from it is the emotional connection between Grogu and Mando, right? Yeah. You know, once you get over the fact that you're seeing this magic trick on screen in front of you, you do forget, like, oh, this is a season finale. He's saying goodbye to Grogu, this character, this sweet baby child character that he's had all these adventures with, and you feel the emotional heartstrings even after you've seen the show and you're rewatching the scene all, all along. So I guess really ultimately at the end of the day, like you can totally usurp all of this technology and all of these fancy editing tricks and all of these uh, musical and audio cues where they bring back the, you know, original theme from the Star Wars movies. And you're just like, oh, that's right. I'm watching a TV show and I'm connecting to the story between this uh, child and this bounty hunter. So I I thought that that was actually, I was like, oh, I'm surprised that actually they did what literally they were supposed to do in that scene, which was say goodbye. And it worked really, really well uh, narratively and emotionally. So Mm. Uh, there's wins, there's wins and losses, but overall the wins outnumber the losses. But yeah, yeah go watch this. What's it actually called? The gallery is that yeah, what they're it's, calling it's it? The gallery, uh, Mandalorian one. Yeah, and just, yeah. This so. is a special one-off episode, separate from the other yeah. stuff. Yeah, so. Chris, you got you got to go watch it. It's fascinating because yeah. they they show you like they because they do like the motion track of what their deep fake looked like and stuff. So you can kind of see like, oh, actually their deep fake was looking pretty good. I'm surprised they didn't go with it, but. You know, they got a lot of really uh, um, talented people over there. So I'm sure they made the right call for the time and the week and the hour I was gonna say, yeah, that they, they were making it. At the end of the day, it's it, movie making is corporate level stuff, right? And they were like, we've got to make calls. And um, hindsight's always 2020, right? We can always be like, well, this didn't really work out well, but that's good. And, and it's funny because, like, one of my favorites, my favorite Star Wars character is, is Plo Koon as well uh, from, from the prequel era. So. Um, yeah, I, I would be in that. Then I was like, "Yes, tell me he lived through that airplane crash, please." And we're yeah. gonna see more Plo Koon because I would love to see that. Also, Plo Koon was the uh, the person who found Ahsoka and got her to the Jedi Temple. So I think yeah. that would have tied into that well. But you know. It's whatever. I, I also like his no nonsense attitude, right? He's just very much like the straight man. Like yeah. he's he's not really one for goofing around. So I like that idea of him kind of butting heads with maybe like um maybe even like a Boba Fett, right? Yeah. You know, Boba Fett is like not exactly goofy, but he'll improvise and go against the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much so. Now the other reason I like the Mandalorian in here is uh, season three is rumored to be the final season for the series. They're looking Ooh. to possibly wrap this up now not necessarily in the characters per se they would show up in other spinoffs but possibly in this on a three season note like a nice little quote unquote trilogy if you will for the mandalorian yeah but what does that even mean for a disney plus show right we've yet to see a disney plus original like wrap up right i i wouldn't be surprised if maybe a disney plus show has been kind of like shadow ban like shadow canceled right like oh yeah. no we're just not gonna make another no one really watched huh. no nobody's really watching turner and yeah. hooch so we're not really gonna make a second season you know and nobody cares about it right i, right. I don't know if that actually well, would, happened but i would say wandavision's pretty close uh yeah i, but I don't we, think we, we'll, i don't think we'll get a second wandavision well yeah i don't think anybody's expecting it either but we do know the character is going to persist obviously because right. she existed and, before the show so it makes you think that will we be seeing mando pop yes, up in that's any that, of these other shows right it, it, yeah the rumor people were like yes that you know he will be around like these characters are not going anywhere like you know kind of thing but like his story will focus on the dark saber and possibly retaking the planet mandalore right because uh-huh. he's now found other mandalorian so um yeah I, I don't know if, if season three was the last and they know it and they write it with that in mind i think that'll be great um if they want to continue going after do four or five i could see it going five seasons pretty pretty easily um because, you know, as a bounty hunter, you're not really limited by what you do. Uh, like, you can go anywhere in the galaxy at yeah. this point. I, yeah, I'm not saying they can't pull it off, but the first two seasons were very much heavily focused on the child, right? So yes. how well can Mando do without, you know, yeah. the child really pulling a lot of kind of the 
pop cultural weight, right, of yeah. the show. So luckily they, they, they started off strong, so the audience is there now, so now they can continue without uh, Baby Yoda. The, the good faith in Disney Plus shows uh, mm-hmm. was, was built vi- from ground one, day one, so that's always a bonus. The Marvel character Werewolf by Night has been in a lot of our news articles lately, and I believe I figured out why. Uh, there's rumored to be a Halloween special for Marvel in the works at Disney+. Plus. Um, I, we did see, you know, Lego is getting a, a Halloween special um, on their Lego Star Wars. The Lego Star Wars had, what, what was it, a New Year's or Christmas special, holiday special? Mm-hmm. Um, Marvel's also doing the, um, what was it, the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special? So if they wanted to do an animated, possibly animated Werewolf by Night ser- uh, Halloween special, I'd be on board with this. Like, like a one-off kind of thing that's like, oh, this exists in Marvel somewhere, or even a, a what-if spinoff if they wanted to. Yeah, to be honest, I have no idea what this is, and I'm just <laughs> doing, like, some slight uh, Googling. To me, it just looks like Marvel at one point in time wanted to write a comic book about a werewolf, so they just made this character, and then... S- once a character is created in Marvel, any writer at any point in time can resurrect it and throw it in an issue, and then it became a recurring character. I'm sure there might be some sort of unique origin behind like how this character became a wolf, but it seems to be pretty standard stock and barrel like werewolf creature, right? Yeah, yeah. Is I think he has the ability to be a werewolf, like more like the idea of werewolf by night. It's not just a full moon kind of werewolf uh, kind of thing. So it might be like. Um, uh, he might be a werewolf every night, like at, at, at like nightfall kind of thing, rather than just full moon. Oh my gosh! The ca- okay, Chris, the character's name is Jack Russell, <laughs> like the talk. <dog>. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that well, is, that is great. I mean, that's totally like Marvel like naming patterns, right? Like, what's yeah. the most obvious fun name that people will recall uh, over and over again we'll listen to him jack russell like the terrier yeah like the terrier he's a werewolf right and it's just like i guess that's the same that's so funny that's great i was gonna say uh this was i believe 70s um when it came out i know there's a newer one called uh jake gomez i believe is the newest werewolf by night um it's it's in the it's in the comic books uh but yeah, so um, yeah, Jack J- Russell, J- Jack Russell or Bus. If the main character isn't named after a breed of dog, I'm not watching it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, so uh, it was interesting because a Werewolf by Night movie was supposed to be uh, announced and uh, was supposed to be filming in 2005. However, there has that, been that no news like, since that then. Sound, <laughs> that sounds like a Sony Pictures move, right? <laughs> like we want to build this villain universe. Let's bring this werewolf to this. Yeah. Game. So what you, what you're saying is that the rumors are kind of focusing around that this might be something animated that'll uh, come out in October, maybe. Not this October, but like next year's uh, mm. Halloween thing. But like. The the there was an idea that they wanted to use this in one of the TV shows I believe that was that was going on recently I think maybe it might have been Modoc or something else uh, or maybe gotcha. um, something that, so they were like you can't use Werewolf by Night and they were like oh I thought you were like pitching to me like something uh, on the level of like Beyonce dropping like a secret album like how oh, amazing yeah, no. would that how amazing would that be you're just in the month of October. You think, like, the next Marvel thing you're going to get isn't until Christmas when, like, a Spider-Man movie comes out. And then all of a sudden you see on Disney+, Plus like, a brand new, like, live-action, like, Marvel series. Like, yeah. I don't even know how you'd keep that on the wraps. But I feel like the only way you could do it is with, like, an obscure werewolf character, right? Uh, because yeah. you could just kind of use fake names for everything. People would just think they're making some weird, like, werewolf thing, like, for right. teens or something. And then all of a sudden it's got, like, a Marvel origin. If, if anybody can ever pull that off, I'd be really excited because yeah. the eyeballs that are just draped over every Marvel property well, and, like, trademark filing are just, you can't avoid it, you know? The other thing I can think of is if, you know, if they snuck it into the what-if planning and they're, like... Oh, okay. And then, like, oh, you're making this. And, like, oh, it's for what if. And then, they, like, it never released. Like, oh, where did it go kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. if it's animated, I guess there's less eyes, right? Because, yeah. you know, continuity-wise, people aren't looking for the animated things. But this could be, like, a fun way because, uh, you know, I, when I was doing my cursory Googling, I saw a couple of uh, a thumbnails of people suggesting that this character might pop up in Moon Knight. So that would be kind yeah. of a fun way to, like, kind of backdoor the character into the universe. Oh, they were introduced were kind rules, of... Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of opportunity here and if they do a Halloween special, I think that's fine and then it doesn't like it doesn't take up like a movie slot down the road, you know, like I'll keep my eye out yes. for Jack Russell. <laughs> yeah, at night, only by night. You'll never know during the day. 
But that ties into Marvel's focus on magic and mysticism seems to be taking a really, really huge upswing lately. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, uh, including Werewolf by Night, this topic, the Midnight Suns, and another trailer we'll talk about at the end of the day, seem to focus a lot on magic. Mm -hmm. um, so the Midnight Suns at Gamescom, we had a trailer for a previously unannounced game that is uh, a tactical RPG. And this is based on a 90s comic book called The Midnight Suns, S-O-N-S. <laughs> and this is The Midnight Suns, S-U-N-S. So uh, have you ever heard of the, the franchise XCOM? Uh, uh, you know what? I remember when it came out because people were really excited about it because it was kind of this turn-based RPG, but it was like next gen, and I think they had tweaked it to where they kind of added some unique gameplay additions yeah. to uh, turn-based. Like because I know, like in the classical sense, it's just like you kind of move your chess piece, and then your chess piece can kind of do like an action. Yeah. And then I, I think like in XCOM, they made it like slightly more real time or something. I never played it, but that's kind of the opinion yeah. that I have of so, XCOM. So the company that made this, Fire Access, makes Civilization games, right? The Civ mm. games, uh, Sid Meier games, whatever they're called. So like they're known for their like simulation and like, you know, top down. But they, they started doing, um, you know, XCOM, which is essentially an alien invasion of the world. You have a turn based kind of game to to battle the aliens as they, they take over. Um, and uh, their last one, XCOM 2, I believe, won a bunch of awards. Uh, I'd have to go back and look. But um, so they they were, in theory, to be working on uh, a Marvel game. And lo and behold, out of nowhere, we get the trailer for Midnight Suns, which, uh, as I told Mike, is set to a hell of a cover of uh, Metallica's Inner Sandman. <laughs> and it gave me a lot of um, Diablo vibes if I will, like the villain Lilith looks like a Diablo character. Mm -hmm. And uh, while this is purely a CGI trailer, gameplay will happen, will be shown on September 1st on IGN. Uh, there's a lot of magical characters and there's a lot of regular superhero characters, including, I believe, one of the first times we've seen X-Men in video games in a long, long time mm -hmm. alongside the yeah. Marvel because Wolverine is right there. Like yeah, I mean, this. this is a Motley crew for sure. I mean, I, I know the, the characters, well, I'm sure the, the roster will be different, like once you kind of do pre-order DLCs and stuff like that mm -hmm. or whatever, but it looks like we kind of got Wolverine, Iron Man, Blade, and Ghost Rider for now. Uh, but yeah, this game looks sick. It's got kind of like this kind of badass, like glow-in-the-dark felt, you know, uh, oh, yeah. 90s Spencer's poster vibe oh, yeah. <laughs> all over it to me. Um, I'm really curious kind of on the business side of things, right? Because, you know, when you make a Marvel video game, since they don't have their own video game studio, it could go one of two ways, right? Either somebody at Marvel is like, I want to turn Midnight Suns into They're a video game. I'm going to, you know, shop this around to see who wants to make it. Or a video game company approaches Marvel and it's just like, we want to make a video game and we'd love to license your IP. What can we have? And then in that scenario, I love the idea that they're just like, oh, we can do the Midnight Suns. You'll, you'll let us do that. And they're just like, yeah, we, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Well, so there is um, Bill Roseman is in charge of Marvel games. Marvel actually has mm -hmm. a games portion where they don't make their own internally but they do license them out marvel mm -hmm. future revolution is a, a game that's kind of like i think world of warcraft that just dropped on phones i've been playing it i don't quite get it uh but i'm not a warcraft person either right but what's interesting this is the th was it the third or fourth uh big console slash pc game in the past year to kind of be announced right like we have marvel's avengers uh, mm -hmm. Guardians of the Galaxy is dropping uh, in October, and this is dropping in March. And uh, there are 13, 13 different heroes, or 12 Marvel heroes, right? So you mentioned the ma magic ones like Blade, Ghost Rider, uh, Magic, Nico Minoru, she has a thing. But you also get to play Iron Man, Captain America, Wolverine, Doctor Strange, and, and Captain Marvel. Uh, but the Hunter, the main chick that they kind of awaken in the trailer... Um, she is your character, and you can customize her how you want to be. So that's, like, your main character, and then you can control the other ones throughout the thing as well. Yeah, because, like, she's, like, the daughter of the villain, right? Is that what yeah. I uh, what I remember from the story? Yeah, yeah, Lola's forsaken child, and the only hero to have her defeated her, it says. So Yeah, so, but what this game could be really cool, it could be really fun, you know, I don't play video games as much as I used to, so I'm always kind of thinking of the strategical, like, brand side of things, of, like, Marvel in general, yeah. where they're just like, oh, let's get some of this Blade 
kind of Ghost Rider stuff back out there in pop culture because we're going to be hitting this stuff up in our cinematic universe soon. You right. know, we want people to not forget about how cool these characters are. So maybe, yeah, maybe now's a good and, time that we kind of license this out. Yeah, the Midnight Suns, again, are a 90s thing, and they had all these characters. Doctor Strange, I think, joined later, but, like, um, I, I think it's very interesting that they're using the newer uh, Ghost Rider, the, the one from the... Uh, who drives the the, mo- the the car instead of the motorcycles? Mm-hmm. Like it's not Johnny Blaze version, um, so it's a, I think it's the biggest change. But yeah, so like I don't know who approached who about using the magical side of this, right? This team, but yeah, it's very yeah, interesting I, on that. Yeah, I am really curious because for any game studio, like putting Marvel characters in your video game it's kind of almost like a cheat code because you get automatical brand recognition, right? So was this game studio like, oh, we want to make like a turn-based game like XCOM, uh, so let's make one. And then, you know, the next meeting is just like, "Uh, do we really want to make brand new characters, a brand new IP, or should we just, like, license something? Oh, let's license something. The next meeting is just like, okay, who are we going to license? Do you want to license DC characters, Marvel characters? What Like, what should we do? And it's just like, well, let's approach Marvel. And then once they find out they're going the Marvel direction, like... Do they just, like, pick, like, what characters they want? Like, did they throw, like, Ghost Rider, you know, and Blade in there? And then somebody at Marvel's just like, well, you already kind of got, like, these two, like, kind of magical uh, characters. Why don't you guys just do Midnight Suns? It's like, oh, that's cool. And then that's where the theme goes. Like, it makes me think that, like, maybe it just not from day one they knew they wanted to use all these characters. But it could have been, like, a a progression of just, like, okay, this is cool. This is where this is going. But either way, the trailer looks rad. Like, as a cinematic, I mean super cool right yeah it, it, it fighting villains uh like bringing someone to life and, and seeing all this look i mean this is really cool and like i said the, the cover of uh entertainment was was really it really just kind of kicks in there um mm-hmm. but I, i'm excited to kind of see the gameplay and how this plays uh, i have xcom 2 on my xbox i think it was like free uh at one point or whatever um i think the difference is uh, when you mentioned dc i forgot about it. dc is owned by warner brothers who has their own game studio Oh yeah, that's right. So, so I think they, they probably they make they're all probably not games. licensing. Yeah, yeah. I uh, like the, the upcoming the Suicide Squad uh, versus Justice League game and, and the new Batman movie. But um, yeah, I'm excited to see kind of where this is and you know how they kind of dove into this because uh, I, I'm excited for Diablo. I'm I'm really on the fence uh, with how Blizzard and the the whole political thing is going on with Blizzard right now internally for the, as a company. But I would totally throw my money at this right now if they, they said, yeah, we're going to do Marvel. And then- oh, yeah. When, when I saw this, I was like, oh, this has Chris's name <laughs> plastered all over it. <laughs> yeah, so very, very excited for this. But this is coming out March of next year on all major consoles, including PS4, Xbox One, uh, PS5, Xbox Series, and PC. So we'll be talking about that later. Uh, real quick before we jump into some of the, the, the bigger stuff here, I want to talk about the uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. They are currently filming outside, so there are a lot of photos coming out of this, right? C- correct me if I'm wrong because I'm forgetting. Is this the, the next movie or the yes. Disney Plus series? There's no bl- – yeah, the Black Panther Disney Plus series is not in progress right now. So it's okay. just Black okay, Panther the movie. 2. Okay, it's the movie. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we have Martin Freeman on set who seems to be rocking a full-on – uh, gray beard now uh, more than his his young uh, and, and also Chris you, you told me earlier lapels the yeah. big lapels they have returned out of the cowboy bebop universe on the Martin Martin Friedman suit here yeah and then um there have been other things like you know there was like a first look at um Ironheart but she right? but like she's just like in a jeans and a shirt I'm like this could be her walking down the like the road like there's no mm-hmm. real here but you know Martin Freeman you know playing Everett Ross returning looking like you know he's he he's he's gone through a, a blip where half the people in the world disappeared. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to to see this. You know, we are, I believe today is like the one year of Chadwick Boseman's passing, sadly. So, oh, um, man. I can't believe how fast they've kind of turned this around and are filming, and you know, we'll have it. You know, yeah, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Martin Freeman's character kind of adapts a bit of like a, um, uh, what word am I looking for when you uh when people are hired to kind of liaison between countries. Uh, why can't I think of the word? Uh, oh, man, it's uh, like a governmental position. What's it called? Uh, why can't I, don't know. Why can't I, I think I don't of know. it? I don't know what you're thinking of. So, Oh, my God. Wow. It's just it's one of those words. Right. Either way, I feel like he's going to be uh, integral in uh, Wakanda kind of yeah. reaching out to the rest of the world. And he's yeah. going to be the political in between there yeah because i mean technically what kind of opened itself up to the world and then everyone was gone for five years at least if not more and then now they're all back uh so i'm i I have no idea where this movie's going man like i am 
completely in the dark uh and i don't know so i'm excited to kind of see kind of what's what's going on with it later so um i'll keep you posted you can see that, that image if you click on the link in the show notes all right now for the real the real fun stuff mike spider-man no way home we got a trailer our first teaser on, trailer <laughs> on, Monday, on Monday, the day after we record the podcast. So, luckily, all the uh, all of the hot takes, the Easter eggs, everything has been filtered out of this trailer, frame by frame, you know, pixel by pixel. Mm. So, at least G- we can gamma kind of up, re- gamma down. Everyone has yes. like like edited this in every which way to figure out what's, what's yeah. actually been. In here. I adjusted some levels on my own to okay. see to peer back in the shadows and everything. Uh, unfortunately, like. 4K trailers just don't seem to exist unless they're upscaled by, like, you know, just some rando channel. So you can't even get more pixels out of it if you go someplace else. You were telling me that, like, Apple has higher bitrate yes. stuff, but that doesn't necessarily – that doesn't always necessarily mean more yeah. resolution, it, just more information. Yeah, less less compression, but, like, that doesn't mean, like, you're going to see a lot more at the end of the day. Yeah. So, mm. so this dropped Monday. Um, the, the leak came out Sunday. We were talking literally about it last week, uh, the leak trailer. Um, I went back and looked, and it does line up pretty, pretty good. After after this mm-hmm. one dropped, I went back and watched it. It lines up pretty good. So uh, I'm I'm glad I didn't really watch that because this was the way to watch it. At the end of the day, uh, this this was this was out of left field. I, I I think it's great that it picks up where the last one left off. Right, like the world finding out who Spider Man is, and it looks like he's going to go through a little bit of that. Uh, we also get to see Doctor Strange just chilling in a, in a sweatshirt, hoodie, and boots. Uh, and his magic cape uh, shoveling snow out of his uh, sanctum sanctorum and then it really kind of goes off the rail because there's a magic spell and when magic spells in the multiverse are involved Mike there's a lot to be taken out of this from 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 this point forward to this that trailer it, it was free game for what was going to happen and uh, I, I don't want to rush through it but like I believe we're getting a sinister six in this movie Mike I mean, uh, that's what it's looking like. I mean, should we just, like, uh, cut to the chase here and just talk about how many villains that might be popping over from a multiverse? Because... I've roughly counted five. Yes. I don't know what the sixth might be. I guess it I have, could be um, the I, the vulture, maybe I have breaking an, out of a cell, maybe. I have an idea. But, but uh, we'll, we'll count yeah. them from most obvious to least obvious. Okay. So most obvious, we have Doc Ock returning. Yes, right. Alfred Molina himself from Spider Man Two, one of my favorite movies uh, in comic book world, and um, he is here de-aged obviously he's wearing his sunglasses which is very important to note that is from very early on at during the bank heist of the movie uh, of spider-man 2 not later in the end uh and uh a lot of people point out his robot tentacles have red lights on them and that's usually when they're in control when he's in control they're white lights so um yes he shows up and he says hello peter in his menacing dr ock voice which is just like if i was in a theater mike i would have cheered i would have cheered for that moment right then yeah and it's very strange right because we have the most information right now off of this character and there's so much that you could possibly interpret right um because first of all he's saying hello peter so if we if we are to assume that there's no other peter parker's in that scene at the moment that he's looking at if he's strictly looking at tom holland Mm -hmm. how would he know that that is, you know, yeah. the Peter Parker because his Peter Parker visually looks different. So I'm trying to figure out when this multiverse starts to fracture and things start to cross over, are there existences crossing over or is it kind of more like Spider-Verse where somebody is just plopped in and everything's different, everyone has the the memories of the place that they're from and they're just like in a new, brand new world like they're on some sort of so- crazy vacation, right? Because it seems as though, like... Because this character is canonically dead in the Raimi universe. Right. They, they drown, so they, they should not look aged. Like, theoretically, if this character was plucked from existence of living, they should be de-aged. And this is definitely an older-looking Melina, uh, which is not a bad thing. He still looks me- – he almost looks more menacing, right, with, like, the, the suit and the glasses that he has on. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think, like – you know what exactly is going on here obviously all is magic at play so literally anything could be the excuse or the reasoning for what's happening but we just don't know yet well i'm gonna i'm leaning heavily towards the um ripped out of existence and plopped into this universe uh mentality could be right could be wrong but like i can't you can't play both sides so that's the one i'm gonna lean into just 
for everyone's sake, that's where my mind is. So I don't think he's talking to Peter Parker, Tom Holland. I think he's talking to another Peter Parker. Uh, you, you, so you think there's another Spider-Man possibly I, on that I, bridge? Which, I do. Yeah, which, it, if it's on the bridge, feel, yes. Yeah, it, it, and then that goes into like the trailer progressions, right? Do we think the second trailer is going to show us another villain, and then maybe the final trailer will well, finally get a look at like another Peter Parker, I, right? To I, really get the hype going to sell the tickets. Well, I think we should. Go ahead and talk about the second very yes. obvious villain, which is the Green Goblin, mm. because we get his laugh and his pumpkin ball. Yes, um, the visual cue. There, there's no, there's no arguing of what that may or may not be. That is yes. straight up Willem Dafoe's laugh. That is his pumpkin bomb. Yes. And I did uh, some googling because I wanted some references on his pumpkin bomb. They like sold that. It, there's like a collector's like physical object. You can really? own that pumpkin bomb. I think it's. I don't know if it was Spider-Man three merch, but like I, it, I, it saw, I saw the box on Google images. Yeah, so like, it, I want to own that now. That looks like a fun, like uh prop to own. Yeah. It's, it, and it's one-to-one, right? Like it, it's not a variation. That is the exact one he used in, in those earlier movies. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think, you know, that, that gives me confirmation that at least Tobey Maguire is going to be in here at some point. Like yeah. if, if nothing else, these two <clears throat> things show, yes, Toby Maguire's universe, his villains, both dead villains at different mm. times, are in this movie at some point. Yeah, and, and and I would I would say maybe our our next villain, arguably not quite as obvious, would probably be the Lightning, right? Yes. Electro, which we've have seen rumors. I think there's even been like possibly some leaked pictures Photos. of Jamie Foxx. Yep. So I think Electro is not a stretch to say there. Yes. So my assumption is, and even even Jamie Foxx, I think he had, what, some tweets up that are Instagram pictures like up that were taken down, you know, a year ago. Uh, oh, yeah. I think I recall Two something years. like that. Yeah. So I don't think we're getting the blue Jamie Foxx. I think we're getting another universal Jamie Foxx who happens to get electrical powers in a different way, and he will look more like uh, the classic Electro, like maybe a green jacket with yellow highlights, and he'll use yellow lightning yeah. instead of blue lightning. Well, yeah, because the lightning we see in this trailer is very yellow. Yes. It's like unabashedly yellow, right? Because lightning, I think more realistically, is white, or I would say maybe more of a blue interpretation when it gets yeah. set to film. This is very much color graded in a yellow direction yes. purposefully. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, I 100%, I think, you know, if, as we, as we kind of lean into you know the 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 second the amazing spider-man universe jamie fox is a strong candidate now yeah. along with those lightning shots i think we get <laughs> yes. a candidate for a fourth villain yes um, this this one that's much less rough like we said we're going in reverse order yeah. and I, i'm assuming you're going with sandman sandman yes because there is um electro controls lightning not weather uh mm-hmm. and if you look at this he is either he's hitting huge debris of dirt and sand mm-hmm. uh, in both of them in both instances so i would believe they possibly maybe maybe the villains are teaming up to take down different spider-man throughout this world yeah uh, maybe uh, so and this this one's like even like there is a screenshot right where he hits a big hit of dirt and yeah. this big column of sand comes up but for like a brief second for one like frame <laughs> it, you could almost kind it almost kind of looks like rounded shoulder yeah. blades right now it's very amorphous we could be looking into this you know I, some people think that they're seeing Mephisto in this, which oh, is like, Jesus what are you doing, Christ. people? So people obviously can look into this more than the, than they need to. But yeah, it is getting Sandman vibes. Now, if it was just that one scene, but we do see that other lightning bolt, and there is a lot of kind of like sand a tornado around, like a cop sand. car or something. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, I think we're leaning Sandman. And, and the the last one, I think, is what I mentioned at the top of the, the, the show, this silhouetted figure, which I tried to raise the brightness. I did a screenshot, the, changing the gamma. I just see more large blocks of pixels that did not help. I don't know what this thing is. So so this is the lizard. This is the Amazing Spider-Man's lizard. I, this was the first thing I went to uh, when the trailer dropped. There, Peter Parker is standing there in a suit and tie, and then something looks like it takes a swipe at an energy barrier behind him, right? Um, yeah, so, there's like kind of like a brief kind of like mystical ring kind of there. Yeah, so I 100% think that at some point in this movie, possibly with the help of Doctor Strange, some of these villains are getting placed in maybe magical barrier prisons. And then he takes Peter there to show him or, or they've, they're talking about you know how some, some of them are out there. I don't know. But I 100% believe this is a lizard version. Now, the actor named Riss Eifens, that's what I was trying to think of in The Kingsman. Mm. I, I don't think it's him. I think it's going to be a CGI character. 
Um, I've seen a lot of really stupid theories say it's Venom, and Venom's not in this movie. Don't go, don't get your hopes up. And if it was, that wouldn't be what Venom does. He wouldn't swipe at something kind of like a lizard, like a, a feral animal would. So I believe this is the lizard, uh, and and he's being protected by uh, Peter's being protected by some sort of magical barrier, and that's what he kind of swipes at uh, in this shot. What do you think after your your breakdown and, and yeah, I mean it is it's a it's a muscular silhouette, and that's about all we can see. It's it's humanoid in shape. Uh, you know, I feel like if they even if it was intended to be venom, they probably wouldn't show us tendrils off the bat. I don't I, like I said, I don't think it's venom either. The lizard makes much more sense with what we've seen so far. But if if you count the numbers, Chris, that's five yes. out of the six. So who's going to be our magical six? Is it going to be uh, Mysterio? Is it going to be the Vulture? Technically, I guess it could be Scorpion. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. uh, those would all come from like Tom Holland's universe. I have a theory. Okay, I believe there's there is this book from Ultimate Comics called Ultimate Six, which is the their ultimate version of the Sinister Six. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they have five villains, and Spider Man is the sixth villain on this team. And I only say this because they kind of blackmail him into joining the team. Now, what if in this world, I believe we may be getting some of the... I think uh, um, Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man possibly might have a Darth Vader syndrome. What if he wants to bring his love life, Gwen Stacy, back from the dead? And he finds out there's other universes where he can get her and be with her instead of the one he was in where she died. So what if... At, now this may change throughout the movie. He may start off as a villain, looking at a way to get his, a get Gwen Stacy back and be with Gwen Stacy, for life. Uh, and then you know he may see the error of his ways throughout, and then turn over, and it'd be three versus five rather than two versus six. Um, but I, I I could be way wrong. I will gladly not say this is correct. But what if Peter Parker, Andrew Garfield, that Spider Man was the sixth version enemy of the Sinister Six? So I, I don't necessarily think, you know, some of the story ideas that you have there are not exciting. But the only thing, the the main vibe I'm getting from this, right, is this is all accidental mm-hmm. is what I'm seeing. Like a spell gone wrong or, you know, Loki could also possibly be involved with, you know, the branching of these multiverses. Right. And everything just is like cataclysmic. Right. It's just one big universal accident and everything just crashes into each other. So for me, I'm finding it hard narrative narrative narratively that any one of these characters from another universe just auto- automatically lands in our kind of MCU and starts making plans, right? right. I feel like you almost got to be there at least for a couple weeks or a couple months or even longer to kind of start making these connections with these other villains and like making a plan and everything because it just seems like all of these villains would just go the selfish route like right away to be like I'm I'm looking out for myself because I don't know what the hell's going on and I'm a right. bad guy so why do I care about anybody else around me I'm out to get the, mine the, so I'm I'm just yeah. trying to figure out like how does this all work which kind of leans me into this this idea that I was talking about earlier where like when these characters get pulled into this universe like maybe their mind's not quite right like they don't really know where they are they don't know that they've been transitioning into another universe maybe magic is play so they just kind of fall back on these like normal primal urges like that's what i'm thinking like i love the idea of like spider-man being the six and being put up against his will but in that comic book, like, aren't, don't they want him to like? They want him to, like a ro- like a rob a bank or something like that, well, or like it, gets it th- was, like. So I'm just trying to think like the stakes would just be so much higher in like a multiversal crash scenario. Well, I, right? I think if you look at the comic book, yes, it's to like take on the ultimate or government stuff. But like in this situation, I I think I don't think it's it's a it's a a cause like a two two universes are meeting one because all these characters have essentially been killed. Um, before, right? In their own, in one universe, Goblin's dead, then Dr. Octopus is dead, and then Sandman's there, right? Like, how could all three of them be here together? I don't think it's as easy as um, that universe and this universe are merging because they would technically be dead. And my, my guess is they, they probably, you know, they're, they've all teamed, they're all teaming up at some point. The, the Goblin bombs are with Dr. Octopus on the bridge. The uh, lightning and the sand are together. Uh, I, w- I don't know about the lizard, but like, 
you know, well, I, and it does make and it does make sense that we're seeing those two things together because yeah. Doc Ock and Willem Dafoe's Goblin would theoretically know of each other from their right. universes, and they could have possibly been transported at the same time, right? Like right next to each other. I think what the the common through thread is here is all of these characters all have grudges against Spider Man, right. and so all of these Spider Men, if you will, are going to congregate. Thus, all of the villains would congregate towards the Spider Men. So, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be just more of a primal urge of, like, defeating my, my arch enemy, and it's not necessarily going to be motivated yeah. by anything else. Uh, like, it makes more sense in the Spider-Verse movies that the Kingpin was kind of controlling all of this, and he kind of wanted to bring his wife back, so he had all of these motivations, right? I just feel like the only motivation these villains are going to have is kill Peter Parker because, like, he's made my life miserable. Well, well that, I mean, they're all... I, I, again, I'm going to lean the other way. I think they all know they're dead or about to have died whenever they're pulled into this. So they want to make this their new home where they can live, and they have to do it without Peter Parker. Yeah. So I agree I, with you. I, I do like that idea. I love that idea of uh, they're extra pissed off because yeah. they're dead and they know it, and they're coming back from almost like an afterlife situation. That would be crazy. Yeah. I don't know exactly how that works in like a, a multiverse or whatever, but right. that, would, that that would be really cool. They've got to set some rules in this movie early on, I think, is, is kind of where we're at. Like where do these people come from and what is their motivations? Uh, yeah. And then I think we'll go from there. I don't think Vulture, even though he's the villain of the first movie, I don't think he is the, uh, I, I don't think he's got the gumption to kind of go after Peter Parker in this world, right? Like he, he even kept him safe from the scorpion guy in the, in prison. So I don't, I don't know. Maybe like you said, maybe they are even, he's like a, an honorable criminal. He could be in it for a little bit. I, I honestly don't know. So, well, I think we're going to, we're going to find out and, and see, but I'm very, I'm very interested in this. I think, yeah. Wh- what's the, what's the over? Okay, so I think another big thing that that, yeah. that I've seen on the internet is some people are a little uh, perturbed on the callousness of Doctor Strange. Right. So that's Doctor, what I, Doctor, that's what yeah. I've been, that's what I've been. So let's seeing. go, back, let's go back to the causation of this event. So that yes. Doctor Strange, Wong says, "Don't do this spell," and then Doctor Strange is like, "Okay, wink, wink, I won't." Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I. It doesn't. I don't think he's out of the character per se. You know, at all. I think he's an arrogant person. That you know, when we met him in Doctor Strange, and the only other time we've seen him was in Endgame, in Infinity mm-hmm. War for a little, like in, Infinity War and Endgame. He's still an arrogant person, right? Like, I feel like that's not gonna go away. Like, he's like, yeah, I can do pretty good stuff. What do you What do well, you think? Well, also, like on the cosmic magical scale of things, I feel like making the the world forget who the identity of Peter Parker is. I feel like it's a relatively easy spell i guess from all of what we've seen right for a wizard to do like you're really just only affecting like a memory you're not really touching you know anything else so it could be a relatively simple spell especially for the sorcerer supreme uh dr strange right and also you know they did save the universe together so there's a kinship there as well and you know we have seen dr strange be cocky in the past but also like people might want to be okay with the idea that at any point in time maybe these characters could drastically change at any given time Mm -hmm. and hopefully it only trends in a good direction because the exact same thing happened with thor but nobody's really complaining about it because it went in a great direction we love goofy thor we don't want serious thor back you know every once in a while it's okay for him to be serious but he seems to be trending doctor strange for the most time like you said before the only time other time we've seen him outside of his own movie he was dealing with the biggest problem in the universe. So right. maybe that's not the best way to, to yeah. gauge how he would deal with, with something uh, At, on a much smaller level. He's also uh, appears to be fighting Spider-Man at one point, possibly on a, a multi-dimensional like train of some kind. So mm. uh, what was the, what if the other th- process is he made everyone forget Spider-Man, including himself? Um, and that's maybe why he's fighting him later. He's like, oh, I don't know who you are. Um well, is that something that, that you can see possibly happening? Yeah, maybe. I think the um, because, because I think the really yeah. I think the really big question here, right, is did all of this happen because Peter stepped into that kind of salt circle, that summoning circle, yeah. and then he messed it up, or was the background like kind of cosmic multiversal collapsing from Loki? Yeah. What affected the universe? Because my my kind of theory is here is that normally this spell 
is very easy, right? Yeah. You know, very easy to do in a normal flat line universe that uh, Jonathan Major slash King has created, right? Yeah. This un- this spell goes off without a hitch all of the time, right? But maybe Wong earlier, the reason he says don't do this spell is like, oh, we've been feeling. We've been getting some weird vibes lately, just out of nowhere. Things seem weird. Maybe we should be careful on some of the magic that we do. The the, the universe just kind of feels off. My sorcerer vibes are tingling. Uh-huh. Things feel weird. I'm Wong. Well, I'm telling you, Doctor Strange, to chill. And he's just like, no, no, no. I do this type of spells all the time. We have not gotten any uh, memos down the line. No urgent emails yeah. that tell us that and- the multiverse is breaking. So he does the spell, and lo and behold... Oh, I didn't know the universe is fractured. Uh, now yeah. things are starting to seep in. That that's kind of my theory, at least. I I don't I don't think Loki will tie into this one based on what I've seen. Well, I, and that's, well, I don't uh, like. Let me clarify. I don't think we're going to see his face, or we're yeah. even going to hear uh, his name, or even like Jonathan Major's face pop up. I think yeah. they're just going to be like something weird is happening that's unexplained. Right. Well, it, it, possibly. Possibly not. Uh, I want. I want to know where the title "No Way Home" fits into this, right? Mm. Is is this even the main Marvel universe? By the time you know Peter is, the spell goes off, uh-huh. like, or does he get put somewhere else? Kind of thing. I, I'm just curious because you know, again, the title's "No Way Home." Maybe maybe Peter's universe hopping instead, and we're looking at it backwards. I don't. I don't know. Like, there's a. Oh. Yeah, that could be because there is there is a pretty uh, interesting montage at the beginning where Doctor Strange is like there's like a bunch of trains that are yeah. in a kaleidoscope pattern and Peter's on top of the train. Like, where does that fit into the film? We're not really talking about yeah. na- that narratively. So, uh, yeah, you could be totally right. Yeah. Maybe they're jumping b- between uh, different universes. Yeah, there, there's a lot of questions here. With that. I, I again, I, I I'm not gonna pretend I know all the answers, but like my question is why is Strange still wearing the Eye of Agamotto if the time stone's destroyed? That, yeah, that's true. The time stone's not in there. Maybe he just has to yeah. put up the impression that he's still collecting. Or maybe, honestly, it could just be a Marvel one-off quip, right? Like, I just like the way it looks. Yeah. <laughs> it could be something as simple as that. Yeah, I, so I was just curious about that because that, that's interesting. I mean, again, frame by frame by frame, every detail. So, Even Peter yeah. gets knocked out of his body at one point. So uh, I feel like last possible character that we need to broach here yeah. is, do you think that's Charlie Cox? slapping down the files and no. he's going to be Peter's lawyer. <laughs> if he is, that's not him slapping down the files. There's an establishing shot earlier where two people are walking into the office. One person's wearing a white shirt and a black tie. He's the one who slams down the files. It's the same it's the same shirt, same body. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you, but also I would wager to say if you were a lawyer, you know, whether you're a superhero or not, and then all of a sudden you're thrown into a universe What's your main priority? To go back to work or try to figure out how to get home, right? I don't think you're just automatically just going to like start, you know, you know, defending people that you literally have no idea who they are, you have no relationship with mm-hmm. and you're from another universe. It's just weird, like right? Well, like why would Charlie Cox just start studying law again? Like wouldn't he just like slap on it, the Daredevil outfit and just go beat people up? That makes more sense not well, for him to be a lawyer. <laughs> I I think it would if he knows he's been transported to another universe. He's just Daredevil. He's a ground level guy, right? Like he can yeah, he's gonna, but he's, he's not just, gonna he's not gonna go back to practicing law he, like in that moment unless he knows he's like literally stuck there well, forever. He right? can it be just which seems out of character, right? But I don't know who else he's gonna talk to. I think I think Netflix kind of shot themselves in the foot, right? There's no higher power than ninjas in in that mm-hmm. universe, right? Like or maybe what, a dragon under under New York. Maybe he's gonna find a way to get that dragon out of New York, Mike. I don't know. I really <laughs> doubt it because the Netflix shows aren't as they're not as deep as these uh, the movies mm-hmm. aren't. They really have that so. If he's there and he's just blending in because he's like, I got to blend in until I find a solution. Totally understand that. Like he, he, he's got to find an apartment. He's got to live somewhere. He's got to, he's got to eat. But like, if he knows law, he could just kind of filter into that pretty easily. But also at the end of the day, all of these decisions and motivations make total sense if you're there for a while. But I'm starting to get the idea that all of this adventure happens at most over a week. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Spider-Man movies got like, I don't think we're going to get that. Those big, the Russo brother styles text over the the screen that says like eight months later, you know? Uh, But who who knows? Well, I, yeah, I think, I don't think, I don't think that's Mephisto. I don't think that's Charlie Cox. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. I, I agree with those. I think those, kind of out the window if charlie cox is in here wouldn't be surprised but like i i i kind of disagree i think there would it would be interesting to see a time jump if dr strange's spell actually works and we're being thought led to believe it doesn't work 
right? Like, oh, uh, like okay, yeah. So, like, okay, I see what you're saying. So he go, Peter goes back to live his normal life. You know, he goes yeah. on dates. People don't know who he is. But then all of a sudden, him and Mary Jane are like, you know, or I guess yeah. Zendaya. I don't know what her name is in the anymore. But they're walking back from like a date, and he looks down a dark, dark, yeah. dark alleyway, and he's just like, what is that? What is yeah, that down there? Because, what is that mysterious figure? So well, yeah, that could be possible. Because if these villains come over and they're not like again, if they're smart, because they were smart villains right throughout the, mm-hmm. the movies, and they were like, okay, well I'm here, I got to figure out why I'm here, what's going on, what what's the one name they all hate? Peter, Peter Parker. Parker. So they're gonna See, look, look at, up Peter look Parker. Look at us, Chris. Yeah. We're uh, we're breaking story here. We're screenwriters right. already. We're, we 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 uh, we broach the problems and then now we come up with solutions. Yeah. If we, if we want all these characters to meet up and work together, they need time. Bam, yeah. we just gave them time. It's, they should have just hired us to write this screenplay. But, we, we, we would have, we would have definitely we, uh, undercut the, the budget because we would not have asked for that much money. Yeah, no, no. We probably would have included uh, more Doctor Strange, but, you know. Yeah. That's what you know, we would have done it for free. Just let us walk around in, on the set in Atlanta. It gives us a lot of juice for the podcast. Well, let's see the other movies. I'd really like to see the other <laughs> movies they're making. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this trailer, I, again, it is the number one viewed trailer. I was going to pull up the numbers here. Uh, Spider-Man trailer views. It beat, uh, I believe, Infinity War and Endgame were the other three that were. Yeah, exactly. I think the number two trailer was the second Endgame trailer, I think. Uh, let me see. Be- uh, I saw, I because, saw like a, a graph the other yeah, day. Yeah, because if I remember right, the first end, end, end game trailer was a little bit of a, not a letdown, but it didn't reveal like anything. And then the second end game trailer, we finally got like, oh, this is what's happening in the movie moving forward. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, for, for me overall, I had to ask friend of the show, Quentin Parker, how he felt when he watched the trailer. Because if you're listening to this podcast, if you're a host of this podcast, you knew all of this, these twists and turns were coming, right? We yeah. didn't know exactly how they were going to be revealed or in what way if we'd see it in the trailer. So when I see the pumpkin bomb and I see Doc Ock at the end of the trailer, I'm just like, this is cool. But I was not surprised yeah. at all. But friend of the show, Quentin Parker, he had no clue. He was shocked. He was like hooping and hollering. He had all of the hype behind it. So I am very envious of anybody who did not has not been keeping track of this. So uh, I will. I think I will. I won't be surprised when I see the the other Peters, but I will be happy to see them, and I'll be really yeah. curious to see how their costumes look. You know, if they're if they've updated it in any way. Are are the Peters going to obviously look older? I've seen right. some people photoshopping like Toby Maguire with a beard on top of. Oh yeah. Uh, on these, and I, I just don't know how a mask would work behind a beard. I don't think that's going to work very well. I think you have to be clean shaven if you're a Spider Man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if and I don't think they're going to go to the what the Peter B Parker or whatever it was from from into the Spider Verse yeah. either. Where oh, he's like yeah. he's like old out of shape. I don't think they'll do that either. Um, but I'm very excited to see the second trailer. We are only. How many how many short months? Four short months away, Mike, from this. Uh, mm-hmm. Less than four months. So you know we were looking at that that, that chart last week of trailer to release um, time, and, and uh, I, I expect another one possibly. What with the Eternals? So this one will hit with Shang Chi. The next one will hit with the Eternals, and then we'll be good to go. You think? Well, yeah, that's the that's the big thing we talked about last week, right? We are very close to this movie coming out, so the trailers are going to be coming hot and fast. Right. Because I think we're at least going to get two more. Right. We'll get we'll get one more that elaborates a little bit more, probably reveals one more villain. And then there'll be get your tickets now trailer that'll show us everything. Right. It's going to show almost all the villains. It's going to show us the other Toby and Andrew Garfield pop up. People are like, holy shit, I get three Spider-Mans for the price of one ticket. I'm going to go buy all my tickets. (laughs) Screw whatever pandemic's going on. I'm just going to pretend it's not there. The only reason I would, I hope they don't is I want to be left with some surprises. I really want to be surprised, uh, you know, personally, uh, from that. But like, you know, uh, as, as we, we say every time Sony does not know how to cut a trailer. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so we'll either be mad or disappointed yeah. in some way. It, but I, I, I do have to say just real quick, this is off topic. Uh, we were talking about Martin Freeman and Black Panther. I finally remembered the term I, I, ambassador. Uh, ambassador. That's the word that I wanted. Everybody knows that word. Everybody knows what an ambassador is. But I had a total uh, uh, senior yeah. moment there. Ambassador. Okay, I can I can let that go. Right, Spider Man. So, Spider-Man. Well, Spider well, Spider Man. I and also say it's because the next movie, literally after Spider Man, is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I totally expect the end credit scene to tie into that, and also possibly a trailer uh, to be tied to this as well for that. Um, oh, that would be cool. So uh, and then Thor: Love and Thunder is right after. I mean, we are 
the first half of next year is just like loaded, man. Uh, mm-hmm. Into the Spider Verse Two is also charted for October of next year, so I can see them doing a teaser pretty early uh, tied to this because mm-hmm. they're Sony, right? It's all Sony properties at this at this rate. So, um, yeah, great, great trailer, full of fun stuff, a lot of stuff to dig into. Uh, and then, Mike, I sent you the someone's edited version of the lizard on. Uh, oh yeah, on Master boosting so. up the levels. They were trying to yeah. do their version of zoom and enhance on yeah. it. So I saw that like the first day uh, it came out. I was like, oh, that's good. It's still, it's still not obvious. I mean, it's very close. Okay, okay, okay. In this version, I do feel like I'm seeing a slight tail, possibly. Like I see a little bit of like a a flap that I haven't hadn't seen before, but yeah, I'm getting lizard vibes now. Right. Like, yeah. And like, like he's kind of like shiny, like a lizard a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Refracting the light as if he's been in a sewer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, check that out. Um, I think that's it for Spider-Man, Mike. I think now we get to dive into our third episode of what if, if no one has watched mm-hmm. this, please get away. We are going to spoil it. We'll talk about it here. <laughs> um, but this is a, what if the world lost its mightiest heroes and I didn't know, uh, we talked last week, you thought it was which one? Uh, Spider-Man? I thought it was going to be Spider-Man and the cape. Yeah, and I was, I was like, I feel like it's not, because uh, I saw a bunch of Lokis. Then I realized it was Loki with an army that I'd seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we get to see Loki. Uh, first, a lot of great voice actors here. Um, I, I do want to say that this confirms the the comic book Fury's Big Week is correct in timelines. Because Fury's Big Week was one comic book series that said Thor 1, The Incredible Hulk, and Iron Man 2 all take place within one week. And this episode proves that that is actually correct in the MCU timeline. Yeah, it is really funny. What a a crazy monumental week for one character to have. And it's really not brought up in the broader MCU, right? There's never really a line where he says, like, I met all of you in one week and my life changed or something. So it is kind of funny. What a coincidence to not really lean into uh, (laughs) screenplay-wise. But I didn't didn't realize it uh, either until I watched this. But, yeah, of course you knew about a a one-off comic book shoot that tied into the MCU. (laughs) I, I have most of the comic book adaptations of the MCU stuff. And this one has always been a big uh, t- uh, point because everyone wants a timeline to work, right? When they say Marvel, mm-hmm. everything's here. But if you say a date and a time, people now have this on a map somewhere. And mm-hmm. they're like, you better be right. Uh, and um, Fury's Big Week has always been a big point of contention because uh, of physically, these movies did not come out the same time. <laughs> they actually, uh, Iron Man, or Hulk was two years before Iron Man 2 and Thor was a year after that. But in the MCU, they are the same week uh, before everything comes together. Now, Captain America is not unthawed the same week either, uh, just to kind of throw that in there. And you see that at the end yeah. of this episode. Well, also, at, at the at the same – is he unthawed the same week? Or no, he, he is not. It was much yeah, later. I, I, yeah, I don't think they alluded that yeah. he was. Well, but, I, all, all, but also, as the turn of events that we see in this – Things go in a different direction, so yeah. who knows? In this universe, maybe the uh, if we're talking about emails, <laughs> maybe Fury gets yeah. the email a little bit sooner that that the shield is out there frozen in the yeah. snow because the, the way a butterfly flaps its wings. But this episode was just this is just fun. Yeah. I love this show because I don't have to worry so much about the continuity or the interconnectivity of where these things are going. I just get to sit down and watch this really fun, just literally what if scenario, and I I actually really like the mystery Mm -hmm. once i got about halfway through the episode i was like who is doing this who is (laughs) killing these heroes i'm actually really i want to know who it is like this is a big mystery and like oh they're invisible but we haven't seen any invisible characters who could this be and then it ends up it ends up being michael douglas and i was just like oh okay like this came the yellow jacket yeah and this does kind of lean into the um the the theory that like a small capable ant-man can just do wonders like we're yeah. not literally going to see ant-man go up thanos's pants uh-huh. but it's starting to lean towards the fact that that's maybe not a illegitimate yeah. strategy right because he kills the hulk yeah. by blowing up his heart yeah. so theoretically ant-man could do the same to thanos i believe yeah he, he killed uh, all of the avengers starting with uh, iron man uh through mm-hmm. uh, an injection uh where he was actually in the needle i believe right uh and went mm-hmm. into the blood and then he uh, punched Hawkeye's hand so the arrow shot Thor. Mm-hmm. Then he killed Hawkeye in a jail cell, 
and then blew up the uh, Hulk in that cool scene from The Incredible Hulk where they're at the, the Princeton University oh, or whatever. Yeah. That scene was so hilarious because I loved c- kind of seeing uh, Mark Ruffalo retconned into yeah. that universe. Like, this is the first time it had ever happened. And then, like, you should have, like, seen my eyes when the Hulk turned into a balloon. It was, like, kind of weirdly terrifying for yeah. me because this is kind of somewhat grounded in a real world even the art style even when it gets a little fantastical and cartoony cartoony it is roughly grounded in reality and to see the hulk get big i was like holy shit what is happening it was really impactful and like it was kind of funny but also since you know it's like quote unquote not real i was just like okay i can deal with this this is this isn't that big of a a loss (laughs) yeah um so they haven't revisited that movie i believe in a long time since then but I did want to say uh, two for two MCU movies this year have referenced The Incredible Hulk. We have uh, – these are all in the trailers. Ross is in Black Widow, and The Abomination is in Shang-Chi. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, they're actually really di- – is this the new movie? Is this The Incredible Hulk, the linchpin of Phase 4, where Thor The Dark World was the, the linchpin of – Avengers Endgame. <laughs> this is just like a middle finger to uh, Universal's distribution rights for yeah. the Incredible Hulk, right? It's just like, hey, we don't need your ability to dist- distribute this character. We'll, we'll put it literally everywhere else. We, we will can. draw it in a cartoon and put it out there. I, I, yeah. I think, um, you know, again, uh, there, there are two kind of sucky parts of this episode. I'll, I'll tell you right now that make it like not my favorite so far. Uh, and this doesn't mean that's a horrible episode at all. I just want to get that way. But like one. The inciting what if incident is never actually shown. Uh, it's just spoken about. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what I was trying to wrap my head around. So, uh, for some reason, uh, Janet joins S.H.I.E.L.D. in this universe. Uh, hope. And hope. Yeah, Hope. That's what I was trying to yeah. say. Hope joins S.H.I.E.L.D. But if I remember right, she, and from the Ant Man movies, like, she's not associated with S.H.I.E.L.D. at all, Correct. right? Correct. So it's just like, yeah, so I agree. That's the inciting incident. At some point in time, some butterfly flapped its wings, and then she decided to fill out, fill out a S.H.I.E.L.D. application. Yeah, I feel like we, sh- like, we should have seen yeah. that. Yeah, but she, I guess it would have it would have destroyed like well, the uh, mystery. But they could have tacked it on at the end. Yeah, they, yeah. They could have whenever he was explaining why they could have shown him why. Uh, they did mention that she was shot outside Odessa, which is actually where uh, the black uh, not, the Winter Soldier shot Black Widow. So maybe she was shot instead of uh, Black Widow on that mission. Anyway, that was from the Winter Soldier. Um, and then also the end is just like Loki gets to take over Earth uh, because he was there. And convince them to let him take over Earth through some sort of means. I don't know what, but like that that ending with Loki was kind of disappointing. At the end of the day, I'm like, oh, yeah. this. Is I guess I, I, have. I guess I didn't make the connection that at the end of the Captain Carter episode that Hawkeye was there. So I kept thinking that this episode was going to end with like Fury uh, turning the Tesseract on and then getting Captain Carter. I, and I thought they were going to connect the first episode to the third episode. So it does really seem that each episode is its own little world and they're putting tags on the, each of them. So I don't know if this is like confirming huh. that season two will just be the second episodes of all of these. What ifs, yeah. or maybe it'll be kind of like, Oh, whatever one was like, whatever the audience responded to the most, will do sequels too, because I don't want to just see sequels for season two. I, I want to see new ideas. Yeah. So I, I, it just seems by a pure numbers game, unless they get around to some of them in like a third season, we're not going to see some of these continue just by, you know, exactly. the episode count. <laughs> yeah. I, and I agree. I agree with that. And some of them shouldn't be continued right some of them just be kind of like okay well have some fun with your mind or imagination if you will Mm -hmm. uh but you know i I think this one just kind of like the ending was kind of lackluster like uh hopefully it does get a sequel because i'd love to see what they do with loki literally ruling earth even though odin's still alive in this universe kind of thing like you know why why is loki here ruling earth he didn't need the the infinity stones there's no thanos so i don't know uh what's gonna happen but um I, I think that those are my two biggest complaints about this episode. Other than that, I did I did call. I was I was I was watching it with my wife, and I was calling out. And I was like, "That's not really Nick Fury. That that's Loki doing like some sort of imagery trick uh, to, mm-hmm. to get." To, she was like, "How do you know?" I'm like, "He made uh, Ant Man or Yellowjack say what he did out loud." He was like, "So you killed Thor?" He's like, "I did." And I don't regret. He's like, "Oh, see, he incriminated himself. So that's yeah, why also, he's doing this." Yeah, and then once he like smacked. 
smacked yeah. a yellow jacket out of the air. I was just like, wait a minute. Like, uh, uh, Nick Fury can't do that. And he definitely can't do that backflip with that weird, like, scissor move. Yeah. Like, this is this is low-key. But, uh, I, again, another another great week of, of returning voice actors, right, from the movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, really just makes it feel that much more authentic when they're in there kind of thing. Yeah, I don't believe that was Scarlett Johansson, though. I that think that was Lake Bell. Lake- Lake Bell. Who yeah. also she did she did a pretty good job. She voices uh, Poison Ivy in the Harley Quinn animated show as well. Oh, uh, so uh, that that's a fun fact. She's she's a voice actress. They also replaced uh, Betty Ross. Uh, that's a different voice actress. That's not actually Liv Tyler. Mm-hmm. I think if you look back on it, but I think everybody else for the most part was their actual voice actor. Was uh, that the guy who plays General Ross? I don't remember the that actor's name. Uh, but he sounded Hurt. He's, he sounded different. If it was William Hurt, we were running into the same scenario that we were running into last week, where these characters don't necessarily sound like themselves, even when the same actor is front, in front of the microphone. Um, but he, th- that character is not so consequential to this episode, where you know it would have to be that actor. Yeah, uh, to the, I'm. I don't have it pulled up, but I, I'd have to go look. Yeah. But I mean, if not, yeah, I mean, like okay. that. The, he had like a minor role. He's like shoot him and that was it like kind of thing it wasn't like a huge yeah. like voice acting but like everybody else was really you know we got uh my wife was like it's like oh uh, I, I she's like i'm gonna be so disappointed because they probably didn't get tom hiddleston for this i was like "Ooh, you're gonna be excited <laughs> yeah. um and then uh what's her name sif uh um Jamie Jamie alexander. alexander that's her second mm-hmm. her second thing this year with marvel again she was in loki and then also in this so Good for her. Yeah. Getting back on the MCU bandwagon. She she put in her time by being on an episode of Shield, okay? Like I <laughs> I give her some some screen time if I Wasn't could. she technically in two episodes or was it just one? I just know the one. If there was a second oh, one okay. it might have been smaller, but I, I'm pretty sure it was just the one. Oh, okay. Uh then Betty Stephanie Panicello voices that I'm still looking this up, but anyway. Um but yeah, I I think this is a, a good another good example of like, you know, hey, this is what the MCU could have been like if uh Somebody who's here. So revisiting those movie moments was definitely a, a good time for me, Mike. I don't know about you. So. Yeah, I'm I'm having fun. Yeah, uh, and now I'm in the dark, and I don't know what any week's gonna be because these were the three initial review episodes for the uh, mm-hmm. screeners. So now uh, there's no like uh, there's no telling what's gonna happen next. So I'm excited to see what mm-hmm. the next uh, what six are. There's nine left or nine total. Mm-hmm. So yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it for the show, Mike. This is a little, little bit of a long one here. Almost almost two hours. Um, damn you, Spider-Man, taking up all our time. <laughs> uh, but if people want to – let's go ahead and wrap this up. We'll keep quick. If people know what you're up to, what you're doing, where can they find you at? Well, they can find me at Mike Royer Design on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and you can read my web comics at pickledcomics.com. Chris, if people want to catch up with you, see what you're doing, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, Valdan, V-A-L-D-A-N, or Instagram, Valdan87. People know about the – the regular episodes listen to our shang chi review next week where can they find that at oh all you got to do is visit superhero slate.com that is home base for the show and you can get our awesome show notes over there at superhero slate.com and you can find us on apple podcasts youtube spotify and wherever else you love to listen to fine podcasts you can follow us on facebook twitter and instagram and you can get merch at superhero slate.com slash store uh, we love hearing from you. Please reach out next week for what you think about Shang-Chi. Are you uh, digging Marvel's What If? Let us know what you think. Uh, what crazy rumors or theories do you have about the Spider-Man trailer? Because it seems like everybody's got their own little idea of what's going to happen. Uh, and if you want to be a super fan of the show, all you got to do is share the show with a friend, share the show with a buddy, and we will be here next week. Stay tuned and look at the feed, and you'll get that delicious Shang-Chi review soon. That Shang-Chi peaches and cream cake? No, gross. Uh, no, get that sour cream away from it my was uh, so the delectable that, desserts. Uh, mine was so good. <laughs> uh, but we will catch you guys next week. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. I only record podcasts when my stomach's full and my balls are empty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God it's dinner time. <laughs> <laughs>